when I started, we were happy to make 20 or $30 a week. Then probably the next week, we might do 100 a week. And then a couple weeks later, 200 a week, then 300 a week, then 300 a day. I learned how to addict the, the, the sellers. If they make so much money, then they're going to go buy things. I'm in now. What's up, guys? Today, we have Freeway Ricky Ross. That's right. The former crack kingpin and L.A. legend, American cultural icon. Rick, if you don't know, was the biggest crack dealer in the 1980s. At his height, he was making up to $3 million a day. He was distributing cocaine for the Nicaraguans who were tied in with the CIA during the Iran-Contra scandal. In 1996, he was sentenced to life in prison. He beat his case, got out on appeal, and today he is a fully legitimate man. He's got a movie coming out, several books, and a dispensary. He's here to talk all about that. He's a legend. I'm tingling right now, you guys. And for more Rick content, go over to patreon.com slash The Connect Show. You guys wanted him. You got him right here on The Connect with Johnny Mitchell. Enjoy. My life is a mirror of America. You know, when you talk about illiteracy, uh, schools not functioning, drugs, prison. You know, I have actually lived the American dream, and I guess that's why so many people relate to my story. That's when I see the lights behind me start to flash. And I didn't even think, I just hit it. I was driving like my life depended on it. Then I parked the car, hopped out, closed the door, and I started running. And he pulls out a burner, a shank, it's like six inches. And then he passes it to me. And he goes, here, that's yours. Don't ever leave the cell block without this. He was the reason I made it out of that place alive. Rick, thank you so much for coming on, man. <laughs> no doubt. Thank you, you are one of our most requested guests, uh, so we're tickled to have you. Oh, they've been asking for me? Yes, they've been <laughs> requesting you for a long time. Uh, for those who might not know you, um, you know, you're obviously an L.A. legend, uh, one of the biggest drug traffickers to come out of the 80s. Um, and it's so interesting because, you know, you're just a local guy, and uh, now you've come so far. But we'll start at the beginning. Texas boy. Yeah, born in Texas. Yeah. Uh, Tyler. Tyler, Texas. And yep. then at three years old or five years old, you end up in South Central. Yeah. Yeah. 87th um, place, cuts off at the 110 freeway. And that's how you got your moniker, Freeway Rick. <laughs> yeah, you did your research. I did. I did. Well, look, I've known about you before the rapper, before, you know, the, the lore that you have now. I read about you in college 2004 i'm reading uh beyond a pale horse yeah and this is about the collusion uh of the cia with nicaraguan drug traffickers and the iran contra scandal so i uh yeah this is like a lifelong dream to yeah, finally 2004 there had been a lot said about me already yeah you know in uh 96 when gary webb did his his article mm -hmm. Uh, Time Magazine said that I was the most talked about person in the country that year. Even back in the 90s. 96. Yeah, yeah. To be exact. <laughs> right, That right. was the year Gary Webb broke uh, Dark Alliance, the story. Right. So that was, that because I was only 10 years old. So this is before social media. This is before right. mass consumption of yes. the drug culture, right? Yes. This is when crack was still really bad. Uh, it was considered really bad. Well, I was, uh, I was, in, I um, I'd already been in prison. Yeah, so, so yeah, it, I guess you could say it was, it was still pretty so, bad. So that scandal in 96, that was huge. The, when, when, that boat, the, when that book broke about the collusion between the CIA and Oh, yeah, and you drug, know, it was, was the big. first time uh, Sacramento Bee, when they released that story, it was the first time any major newspaper had ever released a major story on the internet. Wow. Wow. Oh, right. So this is the dawn of the internet It's age. the dawn of the internet. Right. Wow. Yes. That's had, incredible. Had I been out on the street, I probably would have 10, 10 million followers right, right. now. Right. Exactly. Uh, but by me being in prison and not being able to capitalize on social media, mm -hmm. I think Google was just starting as well. Yeah. I mean, a lot of those companies were, were really babies at AOL, that time. AOL. Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. Rick, I and many other people like me, but especially white Americans- grew up and were influenced by hip hop and rap. I was thinking about this last night. I am not who I am. I could not be who I am today if it weren't for the influence of black America through rap music. I'd be a square. I'd be a dork. I'd be a Canadian <laughs> or something like that. God forbid, right? Yeah. 
And rap and hip hop couldn't have been what it was without crack cocaine. And crack and the popularity of it couldn't have been what it was without you. So in many ways, you and I argue, I argue that white and black America is more united and was brought together more by hip hop and rap and po- its influence on popular culture than even the end in the NAACP. I really do. No, I agree with that. I mean, it, it definitely has uh, crossed the gap. I mean, at one time, you know, uh, they were saying that whites bought more hip hop music than blacks did. For sure. Well, because you guys are down bootlegging it. But anyways, <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. But uh, but so so do you feel like there was some good despite all of the destruction that the crack era brought? Do you, do you think there is some ancillary good I, that I mean, came I out of at, it? I look at life, you know... Um, if they're giving you lemons, you make lemonade, <laughs> you know? So um, whatever happened, um, it's up to us to try to take mm-hmm. that and make the best out yeah. of it, you know? Yeah. Um, me selling crack was not something that I'm proud of. You know, I'm still not proud of that I did that. Uh, it's my past and I live with it. You know, I accept it mm. uh, as a mistake that I made in my life. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it's not something that that I go around and and you know I'm mm-hmm. like you know just ah, yeah, yeah 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 you know I made I made three million dollars a day. Yeah. Well, you're from that generation that you're very you're from that old school generation that doesn't glorify because you had to live it and or you chose to live it, but uh, it's a very understated. You came before the rap. The rap glorified it. You guys right. lived it. Right. Um, so, yeah, because if you listen to the beginning rap, you know, like Master Spade, they were more so talking about what was going on, not what they were doing, mm-hmm. but what was going on in the community, uh, which is something that I believe is different than what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. You know, right now it's more of a glorification for guys who never sold cocaine, but they brag about actually being cocaine dealers and, mm-hmm. you know, and big money havers. So to start from the beginning, uh, you know, it's 1979. You graduated high school. 78. 78. Uh, Dorsey High School. Yep. Tennis star. Yep. Uh, illiterate, though. We all know this. Uh, it's <laughs> totally. wild. That's the LA, LAUSD. <laughs> Let a guy graduate I high mean, school. When you, when you look at my life, though, my life is a mirror of America. Yeah. You know, when you talk about illiteracy, uh, schools not functioning, mm-hmm. drugs, yeah. prison. Yeah. You know, I have actually lived the American dream, and I guess that's why so many people relate to my story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what What was also interesting about your childhood is that you witnessed violence from a young age. Yeah. I think you s- saw your aunt shoot your no, uncle to mom, death. My mom. Your mom shot my bro- her brother my to uncle. death. Yeah, killed him one um, shot, and that turned you off from violence that really yeah, well, my uncle we had become kind of like my father you know i mean me and my mom we stayed with him you know uh even though my uncle had two kids of his own mm. uh but he was kind of like the male figure that that i looked up to you know mm-hmm. that, that i was and and you know I, I i was crazy about him you know wow so to to have you know the one person in the world that you know that i just adored was my mom yeah um, you know, shoot our brother and, and kill him, you know, was like, wow, you know, what's really going on here? Devastating. Yeah. And now, then, you- my mom going to jail, you know, here right. I am in California and we hadn't been out here that long, you know, right. I, I, I don't know how long, might've been six months, might've been a yeah. year, uh, you know, I don't really know. But for me, the, the time that she was away from me and I was with people who were uh, kind of like strangers to me. You know, yeah. I, I didn't really know him. You know, I knew I knew him from what you know mm-hmm. that, that now we, we're staying with these people and I'm meeting them for the first time. But yeah. you know, you're talking about uh, I'm only like four years old because I wasn't in school yet. Mm-hmm. You know, I went to school in, the next year, um, so maybe five. It might have been five when mm-hmm. when that happened. Uh, but you're talking about still being around total strangers mm-hmm. and and in a new life that yeah. that I really didn't didn't understand. But but it was it kind of set the stage for how you operated later. I mean, I don't think it's in your constitution to be violent first of all, but um I think, you know, a- as you're getting out of high school, that's when gangbanging really starts to uh g- grow in South Central. 
uh, Crippen specifically, uh, you knew that uh, was not your path. You knew that gangbanging was not a route you were going to take very young. Um, was well, I wanted to be a Crip when I was around 13, 12 or 13, right before I started playing tennis. Okay. When I first saw the Crips, uh, I was going to Manchester Elementary School. It was the, the end of our sixth grade year. And um, a kid ran to the window and they was like, look at all these guys. And the whole classroom just go to the window and we see all these guys out and they got their blue khakis on and their overalls and they they buffed. And, yeah. And, you know, to us, you know, we're talking about 11, 12 year olds. We're like amazed, you know, at, at all of these guys. Um, and that moment, I wanted to be a Crip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's exciting. They were the community figures. Yes. They were the figureheads at the time. Did you ever meet uh, Tukey Williams or uh, any of those uh, guys that uh, started it? I I never actually talked to Tukey, uh -huh. but I saw him, you know, from, you know, 20, 30 feet. You know, he would yeah. be, they would be at the park. We're, yeah. we're, we're at Manchester Park where we all played uh, tennis and, and basketball and football. Yeah. They would be at the park, but... Um, you know, I, I wasn't, I didn't have enough clout to talk to yeah, Tricky. Yeah, you're too young at the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you know, and you got to have clout too. You know, you just yeah. don't walk up, you know, and talk to Tricky. Prison is the same way. You can't just go talk to a shot caller or somebody yeah. doing life yeah. without, you know, an introduction at least. Right. Somebody has to to bring you there or, or, or put you on or, or you know, it, it's a little more than, mm -hmm. than just, you know, just walking up talking to them. So, but eventually your peers, the people that you're in elementary and junior high school with, they will grow up to become gang major, members. Major gang members. Yes. And this is aligns perfectly with the dawn of the crack era. So you're at the cutting edge of this industry that's going to become in a few years, you don't even know it, but it's going to become, you know, a worldwide phenomena, crack yes. cocaine. But before this, you're in high school playing tennis. Um, who are your influences? This is early. I think Arthur Ashe is the only for other tennis? black well, well, tennis, tennis player at the it, time. We, we Not that you need influences we, to play tennis. No, but no, saying, no, no, know. no, no. But I had them. I had them. My first ones in tennis was Robert Robinson and Larry Barnett. Okay. I don't uh, even know who those guys are. And I'm a tennis fan, but they, they, old uh, heads. they, they both was already ranked in California uh -huh. in the juniors. Um, both went on to get scholarships. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Rob played number one at, at, um, uh, Bakersfield University. Uh, Larry played at um, UC Santa Barbara, mm. one and two. Um, Cornbread, who played number one at um, Texas Southern. Mm. So these guys became the guys that that I looked up to. They were a few years older than I. Um, and they were doing the things that I wanted to do. You know, yeah. they, they were getting free tennis shoes. And so they always looking good. You Stan know, Smith's specials, at the time. Stan Smith's. Those are hot, right? <laughs> Case Smith's. Yeah. You know, so so these are the guys that that I was following at yeah. that time. Yeah. You know. Um, and you were good enough to get a scholarship, correct? Yeah, I could, I could beat them sometimes, yeah. you know. Uh, but don't you think you would have... You know, if you had the grades, you probably would have gone on to play in college. I would have, yes. And then would've. everything would have been different. Probably. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, I, I even beat Cornbread. Cornbread, uh, when I beat him, he was in the top 100 in the world. He mm -hmm. was on tour with Arthur Ashe. He had mm -hmm. been touring with Arthur Ashe. And what he would do is when he came off the circuit, he would come and get me from Dorsey. Mm -hmm. And we would go work out. Uh, also, Earl Prince, who played at UCLA, he was one and two at UC, I mean at USC. So he would also come and get me. So um, I, I became kind of like a, a, a sparring partner for these guys. You know, mm -hmm. somebody that they could get a nice little workout yeah. with. Uh, um, I was never as good as them. You know, like guys I would lose to in the tournament, they would kill. Mm -hmm. You know, when when they saw them. So I, I, I wasn't as good as them. But it's and it still boiled down to having money as well. Yeah. You know, they were able, they had sponsors, so they was able yeah. to play tournaments every week. Yeah. My situation, uh, my mom was on welfare, so I might play two tournaments a year. You know, tournaments was like fifteen dollars. So, you know, I go to my mom, Mom, I want to play a tennis tournament, it's fifteen bucks. Boy, you better get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I had to go out and make my own money to 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 pay my own way right. into the tournament. And, and it's a lot different when you when you when you got one tournament, you know, mm -hmm. it's like 
or you losing this tournament, you ain't playing for another. So much pressure. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. of pressure that that you you wind up putting on yourself. And you always wanted money, though. You always had an entrepreneur's yeah, spirit. Yeah, since I was a kid. You've always had the spirit in you. You know, you did things, uh, you know, I think I read in your bio. I mean, one of them, you worked for pimps. You would keep track of the the time when their hoes were turning tricks. You would knock on the door of the hotel room, say, hey, you got to yep. wrap it up. Uh, you would, I think. That was right after, right after I left high school that I was doing that. Okay. Do you, I, how was pimping at the time? Was that like old school 70s, big Cadillacs, big hats? Yeah, some of them did. They, they had started transitioning into Benzes and Rolls Royces. Yeah, yeah. So a few, a few had that, but most had the Cadillacs, yeah. you know, old, older Cadillacs. Uh, did you think that could have been a viable path for you pimping? i thought about it yeah. i thought about it yeah did you have game like that did you no, have girls no i didn't have girls <laughs> <laughs> well sometimes those are the best pimps because then uh you don't use your own product but usually yeah, but you had to you have to i mean and they, they they had a lot of confidence in themselves you know to yeah. be a pimp you got a lot of confidence you have in a yourself, lot of confidence you know to 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 get a woman to sell her body yeah and then give you all the money you know, it that was takes like, mouthpiece. For me, it was like baffling to, to 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 actually see it, you know, taking place. Um, but you know, they were doing it. You you have this, and we're gonna get to it when we get to prison. But you are part of your ethos, part of your uh, the way that you look at life is optimism and manifesting. And when you were locked up, you read books like Think and Grow Rich. Etc. That's that indefatigable spirit that you have. I I think maybe part of it is you know being short, being from the hood. You're like the underdog. This is an underdog story. Did you feel that way? Did yeah, you feel like? Yeah, I always you feel, feel like, like people discount me, but watch. I'm gonna I always, make something. I always felt like I was an underdog. You know, even even with uh, with the schooling. You know, all my brothers are a little smarter than me in school. You know, they all got better grades than I did. Uh, so I've always kind of felt like the underdog and some things, you know, but when we get on the football field, you know, I felt like I was in charge, you know, on the tennis court. I felt like that, that I would be in charge of, of what I was doing running, you know, I was faster than, than most of them. So there were certain things that I felt that they were better than me in. And then there was things that I knew that I could outdo other mm -hmm. people in. Mm -hmm. Did you, even after, you know, the disappointment of not going on to college with your tennis, did you feel like I'm going to grow up and be somebody like I'm going to, I'm going to make it. At did first you I was kind of, I was kind of, I was kind of, I was kind of down, you know, for a while, mm -hmm. you know, um, it was embarrassing, you know, when everybody found out I couldn't read, you know, I'd hit it for, for a while, mm -hmm. you know, but when everybody found out I couldn't read, it was embarrassing. And then I kind of, shied away. I used to go to Dorsey. That's where we used to play at, at, at Rancho Park. So I kind of shied away from that community. And then I started hanging back into the community where people don't care if you can read or write. Right. You know, they want to know what type of gun you got, right. how well you can fight. Mm -hmm. You know, those, those um, criteria changed mm -hmm. on what they uh, expect. From values are different. Yeah, I guess you can say values are different. So you're out of high school. Uh, you, I start. You're going to a technical college now. You, I believe, start apprenticing yeah. as a car upholstery. Yeah, uh, for a car uh, upholstery. Trade tech. Trade tech. Well, okay. I was doing. I was doing two of them. I was going to trade tech to play tennis, yeah. which I really didn't go to school at trade tech. I just, you know, really show up for tennis practice. And, <laughs> okay, and and go to the matches. Um, uh, Coach Pete Brown and, and Norman Tillman. Um, Kind of came over to the house and they was like, man, we got a shot at winning uh, the title at Trey Tech this year. We really need you to come on the team. Uh, we'll get everything set up for you and, with the schooling and whatnot. And, uh, you know, Norm filled out all my papers mm -hmm. for me to get in, get in Trey Tech. Uh, I took book binding at Trey Tech. Mm -hmm. That was that was supposed to be in the class I was taking. Uh, but I also was doing uh, upholstery at Bennett Skills Center. Car upholstery. Yeah, car upholstery. And through doing that, the guy that you were working for, that's is when you first get introduced to cocaine. No, no. He, he didn't introduce me to cocaine. Well, uh, who introduced you? Was it Ollie or was it? No, Michael. 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 McLaurin. Okay, gotcha. So this is around the same time. It's the same time. It's, Did it's, you know, had you ever seen powder cocaine? On TV. <laughs> You've never seen it in real life? No. Uh -uh. Did anybody in the ghetto 
excuse, you know, if that's an offensive term, did anybody from the hood in 1979 have the money to spend a hundred dollars on a gram of cocaine? Like, was that at all? I know PCP was big. Nobody you know, thought brick, it, brick nobody, weed. nobody thought it was, it was possible. Um, like yeah. I imagine the only people down in the hood that had powder cocaine money were pimps, right? You hit it on the head. <laughs> yeah, right? They were and you know, that was like the super fly, uh, yeah, glorified. It, it was not seen as a bad thing at all. No, no, it was it was I mean, cuz I was hanging out with the pimps, so I used to hear him brag about, you know, oh man, I blew $500, you know, on cocaine the other night. And then, and then I used to ask them, man, man, let me get in the cocaine game. Let me get in the cocaine <laughs> right, game. Right, right, right. And none of them would, you know, none of them would, oh, you too young, stay out of that. Mm. You know, leave that alone. Right. But they always told me, never get high. Don't you ever get high. Don't you ever get high. And you, you know? listened. Because I was like their little brother. Right. You know, like right. my first low rider, uh, this pimp TQ bought me all my hydraulics for my mm -hmm. car. You know, he cut my car front and back for me. Yeah. So I, I become kind of like the, the, the gopher, you know, yeah. like I would go to the yeah. store for him. You yeah. know, I would just do stuff for him, wash their cars if they needed their car washed. Uh, um, so I was kind of like a gopher for him. Yeah. And even, even, even their girls, their girls, they liked me too, you know, like, yeah. like even right now, a couple of them come by, you know, where my shop is right now, um, one named Vanessa, she comes by and, you know, she still treat me like a little brother. Oh, wow. I can't imagine what she looks like now. <laughs> just, just kidding, ladies. Just kidding. Because uh, I want to get this straight. Did you, when you first got put on, I think it was like a couple of grams? No. About, how, how did you How did you about first? About two tenths of a gram. Two tenths of a gram. Yeah. So did you cook it up right away? Because there's a story about how the pimp mm -hmm. first showed you what crack was. But was that the first thing that you sold or was it actually powder? No, it was powder. Okay. He might gave me powder the first day. Uh, I took the powder and I ran into Martin, who was a pimp that I knew. First, we went around to all of the, all the guys, all the old heads that who we, who we thought was like super cool in the hood. Yeah. We went to all of them. You know, we went to Barney. We went to Alfonso. We went to Black. And then finally, it was like getting kind of exhausting because it was yeah. like, and don't nobody know what this is, you know, because we didn't know. We thought cocaine was supposed to be white, mm -hmm. but this stuff was yellowish, like, like almost you, like a pea color. Right. And I, I was a little afraid that that Mike wasn't telling me the truth, you know, about what it was. Right. And I was a little nervous about selling it. Yeah. Because, you know, in the hood, I mean, we I saw a guy get killed at, at the liquor store with a dollar, you know. Right. Uh, so... In the hood, you know, a little money can 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 because it don't be the principal. It don't be the money; it be the principal, as they say. You know, right. oh, oh, I didn't kill him over the dollar; I killed him over the principal. Uh -huh. So uh, we were really want to be sure about what we were doing. Mm. So we ran into Martin, and then Martin cooked it up. Okay, and he was the one. Your first months in the game, he was your cook, right? No, he, he 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 was my first customer too. Oh, okay. Even though he 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 cooked it up, he wound up smoking the whole rock. Yeah. It was very little. I yeah. mean, it was so small once he cooked it up and he took a little piece off of it and and he was like, Man, ain't nothing left. I might as well do all this. I'll just pay you Friday. Mm. And that turned into later on that day he came by with a big mouse. Uh, Mouse is, is is like a legend in L.A. Uh -huh. You know, I didn't know Mouse at the time when he first brought him by. He was a crip, right? He was a crip. Uh -huh. uh, one of Tookie's guys. I okay. Mean, swole, you know. Yeah. We, they, they used to call him Big Mouse. Uh, Mouse spent $100. And that was my first sale. Wow. And then that's when you knew you were like, okay, there's something to this. This is a business. Oh, yeah. 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 Because yeah. $100 back in 1980, I mean, that's a lot of money. It was a lot of money. Wow. So you're on. You're on. Oh, now, yeah, what, we popping now. Now, how long? Now, I got two customers. I got Miles right. and I got Martin. Right. So, even though I didn't know Miles, uh, I knew Martin well enough to know that Martin wouldn't, wouldn't bring nobody to me that I had to worry about. Okay. So, how did those first, how did those first six months look? Were you? Very uh, slow. Okay. Very slow. Why is that? I didn't know nobody that smoked cocaine or used cocaine. Right. You know, it was right. it was like that's how early you were to it. Yeah. Like yeah. You, you hadn't even a market hadn't even really developed. No, not like it, it was when say eighty two, eighty three. Like any of my guys, mm -hmm. I could give them 
five ounces and they could go walk on the block and they would sell it all in, in maybe 30, 40 minutes. Right, right. It wasn't like that when I started. Because you know what's interesting is that history tells us that crack first really took hold in the inner city around like 84, 85, but you were four years before that. Yeah, yeah. It was truly like an infant when, industry. When I started, we were happy to make 20, 30,000, 20 or 30 dollars a week. Selling crack. Yeah. Wow. And that was, I mean, that's like better than a minimum wage job a little bit back then. Ah, I mean, it, it put, it put some pennies in your pocket. Right. You know, I was able to skim a few dollars off to buy me a burrito. Uh, wow. I mean, it was, it was, it was slow at first. Wow. And so, uh, and how do you market yourself? You just go around saying, Hey, I got this thing. It's called no, crack. Mm -mm. I, I just wait on, on Martin and, yeah. and, and, and mouse, you yeah. know, when, when they need it more. They would come by and they would might come by with, you know, two girls in the car, two prostitutes in the car. Yeah. The prostitutes would see me. Then when 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 they wasn't around and the prostitutes would come over and buy. Right. Right. And then the prostitute might bring a trick by with her. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then you meet the trick. And yeah. then, you know, it just it just keep, you know, person by per, one person right. at a time where you just keep building when, and building. When do you building. remember business really picking up? where crack went from being this kind of niche thing that pimps, prostitutes, tricks, smoked to kind of normal everyday people. What year well, was it that? It took a couple of years. Uh, my mom put me out of her house okay. you know, because people was coming over and she was like, who is that in that Cadillac? Who is that in that Benz? Right. What are they coming over here looking for you for? Yeah. Why they want you? Yeah. So she recognized you know, my mom wasn't a fool, so right. she's recognizing yeah. that different type of people are starting to come. Right. And it ain't, you know, you know, my little dirty friends <laughs> right. that, that we hang out <laughs> with, you know, all the time. They're not coming. These mm -hmm. are like grown men and, and women and yeah. cars right. and, you know, wearing suits. And, and wow. she was like, what do all these people want with you? You getting out of my house. So she put me out of her house. Hmm. Where'd you go? Well, at that time, when she put me out, I had some money then. I'd already right. saved up about, I don't know, probably about 50000 What year is this? Mm, probably 81, 82. Okay, so business isn't that bad if you're able to save, you know, 50, oh, no, 50 no, Gs. No, 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 we, we went, you know, we went from doing 20 a week. Mm -hmm. and then probably the next week, we might do 100 a week. Yeah. And then a couple weeks later, 200 a week, then 300 a week, then 300 a day. Yeah. You know, yeah. so- when, when so, I'm making 300 a day, you know, I'm able to keep $100 for myself. Right. So now I'm making $700 a week. And what's interesting about you is you spend nothing. Nothing. But you are fascinating. You are a lesson in business discipline because unlike most people, including myself, even in legitimate industries who do bubble, you're right, they'll hit a lick, they'll make a, a stack of money. And then they're scared to reinvest it because they're like, oh, I don't know if tomorrow is going to be the same as today. I need to squirrel my money away. You got the money. Not only did you not spend it on any stupid drug dealer stuff, almost every dollar that you brought in from sales, you reinvested it into a bigger supply. Yeah, I learned how to how to addict the, the, the sellers. A, how, your suppliers? Yeah, you addict How them. did you addict your suppliers? With money. Right, you became their See, best make, customer. If they make so much money, then they're going to go buy things. You know, like they go buy their wife a candy store. Oh. So if the candy store don't make no money, then they still got to sell drugs to, to pay the bills right. for the candy store. Right. They just bought a new car. Right. And me, I try not to take on none of those bills because those bills literally be make you become like a slave almost. Yeah, slave to your own business. Yeah, yeah. so... I, I try to stay away from those things because I don't want those those cuffs on mm -hmm. me. I don't want those right. those things to tie me down. So yeah, I would I would just take my money and pull it back into the drugs. Right. So they probably thought when 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 I was buying six pounds of cocaine, they probably thought that I was just Balling out of control. Yeah, living lavish. But yeah. What I did is I was taking all my savings mm -hmm. and I was buying it with with that. Yeah. Because okay, so you owned your own product. You never after you got going, no more product was fronted to you. You were no. COD. Yeah. COD. So you were your own man. Mm -hmm. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying the episode. Let me take one minute to remind you about our longtime flagship sponsor of the Connect, Mood, America's number one 
online dispensary for Delta 8 and Delta 9 products. Are you still living in a state where THC products are unbelievably still illegal? Don't worry. Mood has you covered. Their Delta 8 and Delta 9 products comply with all federal regulations. They're completely legal. They're legal to order, ship, and consume. And Mood has worked with the federal government to ensure this compliance. Right now, go over to mood.co, their website, and you'll find the widest array of gummies, edibles, flour, vape, and use promo code CONNECT20, that's CONNECT20, to get 20% off anything on their website. And of course, if you use promo code CONNECT FREE, that's C-O-N-N-E-C-T FREE, you will get a free five-count pack of gummies. All you do is pay for shipping. There is nothing to lose. Go over to mood.co right now and enjoy your Delta 8 and Delta 9 products. Now let's get back into the episode. Okay, say the first, after your first year, how big is your re-up looking? And are you still buying? At what point do you meet the Nicaraguans? At what point do you outgrow your your original connect and move up to well, we, we left get Mike, a better price? We left Mike pretty quick because uh-huh. Mike Mike was 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 snorting. I don't know if he was smoking as well, but he he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't on his business. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so I I we left Mike probably after about four or five months. Okay, we stopped buying from Mike. And who did you go to after that? Well. I went back to Venice Skill Center because I was working on a car. And so I go down to Venice Skill Center and I'm like, Mr. Fisher. Matter of fact, Mr. Fisher stayed right over here too. All right. So I met right. the Nicaraguan right in this neighborhood. Okay. Okay. So I, I go to Mr. Fisher and and not looking for no connection though. Mm-hmm. I wasn't looking for no connection. I just go down there just to chop it up with him. And you know, we should play tennis together. Yeah. Uh, so you're uh, selling crack and playing tennis still? A little bit, not yeah. so much tennis. I done pretty much gave up on tennis. Okay, I'm, I'm putting guys on the circuit now. Yeah, you know Larry right. and Troy, all the guys I went to high school with that were like my friends. I, I helped them go on the circuit. Oh on wow, the pro circuit. Okay, so you're uh, putting your drug money behind uh, tennis players who you like. Exactly. Well, wow. these are my friends. They're yeah. not just tennis yeah. players. These are like my yeah. my the guys mm-hmm. I looked up to. Mm-hmm. Like you know what I'm saying? These are my guys. Yeah. So uh, when I go see Fisher and, and he's like. Where you been? You know, because he knew how much I like working on cars and mm-hmm. stuff. And he's like, where you been? Why you ain't been around? And I'm like, ah, you know. And I don't want to lie to him, you know, because mm-hmm. it's my guy. Yeah. You know, I don't want to tell him that I don't want to tell him I'm selling cocaine. Yeah. You know, like, how's he going to feel about that? Mm-hmm. And um, then it just came out, you know. Oh, man, I've been selling cocaine. And he was like, what? And he was like, man, come by my house. He said, you think this gold and I got on my neck and that Cadillac mm-hmm. come from this job I ain't come from this job and I went over to his house that night me and Ali and uh he told me you know like man I used to sell cocaine I made two I made 250,000 which I didn't even know what that was at the time I was like 250,000 right. what is that <laughs> <laughs> like a gajillion dollars <laughs> yeah yeah so uh he was like I got somebody I'm gonna introduce you with too and uh he called this guy over the guy was from downtown he was a jeweler and uh, the guy said, we're going to introduce you to somebody. So then um, they called and Henry came over. Henry was, looked like, I thought he was Mexican. You know, I didn't mm-hmm. know what a Nicaraguan was. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, say that again? <laughs> I didn't know what a Nicaraguan was. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. that's not how I would say it. But yeah, <laughs> I call it a Nicaraguan. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I speak Ebonics. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no judgment. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh I met I met Henry. That was the first day I met Henry. And Henry, who is Henry? Henry and then what is his connection to the Nicaraguans, to uh, Danilo Blandon? His sister was married to Danilo. Okay. And Danilo is a major character in this whole saga. Yeah. Danilo um, was the minister of agriculture for Nicaragua before they got kicked out. Right. Before the, uh, the revolution in 1979. And yeah. that's what sent a bunch of Nicaraguans, you know, the what was called a communist or socialist revolution sent a lot of the Nicaraguans who controlled the country. They had to flee. And a lot of them came to America and including Los Angeles. Well, all of them was part of that. Henry, Ivan, Mm -hmm. Danilo, uh, Mr. Green, the, the Torres brothers. And these are, and what's so interesting about that whole cadre of people is they were all used to be, politicians. And as you say, the ministry of agriculture and everybody was part of the oligarchy. Uh, and then they just rolled it over into cocaine trafficking. 
Right. So now here they are, and there's about to be a boom. And they all were smart. Yeah, and they're very smart. They they opened college, restaurants. They college had college graduates. degrees. Absolutely. Um, rental cars. Right, totally. They had rental car businesses. Car they were lots. different than the Mexicans who were these street people. They were the- Yeah, they, they, were they wasn't workers. They wasn't really- They weren't workers. They wasn't exactly. really workers. Exactly. Um, so They wasn't going to pick no fruit. <laughs> no, uh-uh, not at all. So we've got, uh, now here you are, you've made a, a connection- Almost to the source. They yeah. were getting their cocaine straight from the Colombians. And I'm buying now, I'm buying body, probably like two, three ounces. Which is a lot of coke back then. How much was an ounce an back ounce? in 1981, My first ounce I bought was 3300 <laughs> Oh my God. I mean, 3300 bucks. And this is, you know, obviously, and this I can is make 9000 off of it. Can we say that one more time for the clickbait? <laughs> you you were paying thirty three hundred an ounce back in nineteen eighty two, and how much were you making off that ounce? About nine thousand. And and you were well, we would cut up nine thousand. We would never make you know you never make what you're supposed to make. Yeah. Because you know you're gonna get people gonna come back. Oh man, I spent this with you. Yeah. I need some credit. And, yeah. And, right. You know stuff like that there. So you you stack up nine nine thousand. And now yeah. how are you doing that? Take one ounce. Your what are the crack economics of that? Like, how do you take an ounce, which is 28 grams, you've just spent 3,300 bucks on it. That's insane. What, what do you cook that down into to make a profit of nine grand? Well, we would cook it up in little, little, little jars, little beakers. Right. It was like little bitty, little bitty beaker jars. And then we would have all of these jars, just, just fill them up with grams each. Each one yeah. have a gram. And then we would take those grams and we would cut it. Okay. So what is, what is an average? So you take a little stone off of each gram. You've got- Well, you cut it in the, you, you would try to cut it. You, we, and we used to eye it on mm -hmm. the cut. On the cut, we would eye and we would try to cut off of one gram. We would try to do like $300. Off of one gram. So how does that break down though? Into each sales worth what? $10 rocks? Or those no, $20 each, rocks? Each sale would be like 50. Okay. So this was expensive crack. Oh this yeah. This $50 for uh, essentially- We didn't call it crack anyway. That, that's some government- Stuff what did they, you call it? Ready Rock? Ready Rock. Yeah. Okay, so it was Ready Rock. Crack. It was just cocaine cooked. Right, which that's what crack is. It's just cooked cocaine, yeah, right? You know, when 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 we started hearing about this crack stuff and we thought they were adding, you know, uh uh ephedrin to it or something. We didn't mm. know what they was mm. doing. Like yeah. we, we didn't know what crack was. Like, so, so when did you you didn't call it crack? What what year did you start calling it crack, if ever? When I got to the feds. <laughs> right, 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 right. They arrested us and they was like, Oh, you charged with crack. Well, you know what's so interesting? I remember reading an article uh quote that quoted you saying you didn't really see it as this thing that was so bad, like worse than powder cocaine. Because you remember like, not like heroin, where you see junkies nodding out, dead in the street with a needle in their arm. You would watch housewives, mothers, smoke a rock and then go make dinner, Yeah, right? You saw it as this like clean functional house. thing. Right, clean house. Well, yeah, definitely clean house. But um, how bad is crack for you? Does it bring people to their knees? Well, my, the way that is my, portrayed in popular my culture. My son's mom was on crack. And, okay. Um, heavy smoker. Yeah. And you know, I heard about the crack, the crack babies, and but that would came later when yeah. when when she was doing it. We didn't know was right. no such thing as crack baby, but um, I, I was trying to stop her from smoking, but she still, you know, would did would do it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but he came out perfectly fine. Right. And she would go through her little stuff, but once she would sober up for a couple of weeks, she would be normal again. Right. But I, I guess that craving would always be there. It's like it was really hard for them to uh, stop for long periods of time. Right. You right. Know? But uh, I never saw any long term effect on, mm -hmm. on um, you know, people who use crack. So uh, obviously using a drug like cocaine whether you're snorting it, shooting it, smoking it, long-term, there's terrible health effects, right? Your heart will give out. There's not a lot of people, I imagine, smoking crack that started in 1980. They're still smoking today. I'm sure there are some. My uncle. Your uncle's still smoking? <laughs> wow, you got a, he's got a good ticker. Yeah, you know? he, said, uh, he said he don't see anything wrong with crack. Wow. And he's, he functioned as a crackhead this whole time? Has he had it, held a job down? Or no, he, he don't work. Okay, well- this is undermining my point. 
uh, perhaps <laughs> making their point. Uh, but, but, you know, but here's the thing, like, I'm just trying because the way what the government did to justify these incredibly unequal crack to powder sentencing guidelines was by trying to paint crack as the devil's drug, as a much oh, worse drug than and powder cocaine. They but did. is crack that much worse of a drug than powder c- cocaine? Well, a lot of the things that they put on crack, we found out weren't, weren't true. You know, like yeah. with the crack babies, mm-hmm. we, in those commercials, in the news clippings that they used to do, we found out that those babies were really alcoholic babies. Right, uh-huh. They weren't uh-huh. crack. Harvard yeah. did a study and they found out that there was no long-term effect of a baby on crack. And those babies that they would have on TV shaking and stuff, those were actually alcoholic babies. Uh, So what they did was they wanted to paint this picture uh, uh, of the crack dealer, Mm -hmm. you know, where they would have guys on TV with the guns and the violence so that they could uh, uh, make the laws tougher because they knew that blacks would be the yep. ones who would get, get arrested the most. I mean, even with the White House, remember the White House did that sting where the Bush, guy- Bush, right? Holds up the- Yeah, but you know, this guy was going to sell the cocaine to him about four miles away from the White House. Right. And the cops recommended yeah. that he go over to the church mm-hmm. and they would buy it by the church so it would be closer to the White House. Right. So it was all kind of little props that they were doing yeah. to-, to, to Fear mongering. Yeah, to, that's, to, to generate that that's right. fear. That's, that's old school fear mongering. I mean, they, they did that with marijuana back in the day. They, you know, in the 1930s, reefer madness, they would show a black man smoking a reefer stick and then going and, and kidnapping a white woman. Yes. That's really interesting to know, though, uh, because, you know, you saw it firsthand. You were like, I, y- y- what you were doing was, yeah, you're, you're, it's harmful. Drugs are bad, but you didn't Absolutely. see any discernible difference between the effects of cocaine and and I mean, I, I, so-called I, crack. I, I would even say that I didn't, even with, with people who drink yeah. alcohol, yeah. was worse than crackheads. Right. Which you probably saw a lot of alcoholism Absolutely. in the hood too. My hood yeah. was, it's, I mean, you, you talk about in the ghetto, these people are trying to I guess what you would say, put a mask over themselves. They're not happy with where they're at. They're not happy with their living facility. They're not happy with not working. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, So for them, the easiest way is to block it all out. Mm -hmm. So whether it's alcohol, cocaine, Mm -hmm. PCP, Mm -hmm. pills, cigarettes, they're looking for a way to escape their reality. Right. Yes, unfortunately, that is the case and continues to be so. So now here you are, you've met uh, the plug, basically, right? You've met met Henry. I'm in now. You met Henry, your price goes down? Yeah. um, I think Henry, the first time we got an ounce for 2,600 was from Henry. Okay, so your price has gone down about $600. Tremendously. Okay, gotcha. Um, At what point do you now start putting other dealers on and step back from hand-to-hand sales? Well, I'm still hand-to-hand uh, most of the time. Uh, I'm still standing on the block. Still I'm standing st- on the block. Yeah, I'm still standing out on the street. Uh, I had two friends. One sold PCP and one sold marijuana. Mm-hmm. And I knew that they had money. You know, they had been doing this years. Yeah. For years. Yeah. So I already figured that they had a little money. And I had started to understand now that the more cocaine you buy the cheaper it gets. <laughs> so I go to them and I was like, look, you selling, you selling PCP sticks, you making $10 a stick. I sell cocaine. I sell two tenths of a gram of cocaine. I get 50 bucks. Mm. I said, mine coming 50 at a time. So I'm out doing you right now. Eventually I'm going to be richer than you if you don't get involved. So I talked both of them to getting involved. They both bought an ounce a piece. So now we're going we go on, we buying maybe four or five ounces at mm-hmm. a time. Right. At first, I wasn't making any money off of them. Right. You're just giving it to them on the strength. Yeah, just, just to build clientele. Just to build clientele yeah. and to make the connection know that I had some money. Yeah. You know, I don't yeah. want to lose the connect. Right. So my money started to grow even more. Mm-hmm. So now I'm able to buy a pound. Are you buying it in pounds? Yeah, not, we start off kilos? at pounds. They didn't start us off at kilos. They, they worked me on that. So you go, you go cop 16 ounces. Yeah, it okay. was it was so funny when uh, Ivan, when I first got out of prison, Ivan was still alive. And who's we, Ivan? Tell us who Ivan is. Ivan was the guy who was Henry's boss. Gotcha. 
Even right. though Henry's sister was married to Danilo, I guess Danilo didn't, he didn't really mess with Henry like that for some reason. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so Ivan was the boss. And when you say boss, he's the one who's directing all of the distribution. Of Henry. Okay. Of Henry. Yeah, okay. So when, when I started buying 16 ounces, my poop partners, they kept buying ounces. So I started getting them a couple hundred dollars cheaper. Mm. And then Ivan told me, he say, oh, don't tell them how much I give it to you for because they only buying one ounce. They can just buy from you from now and they don't even have to come see me no more. Right. So now I start to make off of them $200 yep. off of each one of them yeah. every time they come. Yeah. And how fast could they move ounces? Well, they started once a week. Yeah. And then they started once a day. Yeah. And then they started four a day. <laughs> then they yeah. started 50 a day. Right, right. So these two guys really took care of everything that I needed eventually. Right. These two guys got up to where they were doing $400,000, $300,000 of purchase. Okay. And how much is that at the time? Like what quantity is it's that? It's according to what price, you know, the price fluctuated. Can you give us an example of somebody spends in 1983, let's say $300,000. What does that get you? Three kilos? No, probably would have got them 10. Okay. 10 Close kilos. 10. Now, okay. Let's, let's clear this up. They call you a crack dealer, but after you, after your two buddies become your distributors, did you ever sell crack anymore? Yeah, I did. So it's hand to hand, or would you actually cook up wholesale? We, so if, I would cook wholesale. We used to cook up about how? 200 kilos a night. Stop it. I don't believe you. 200 kilos of Coke you could cook up into crack. Yeah. How long does that take you? You must have had factory lines. <laughs> like three hours. So 200 kilos of crack, how much powder does it take to make all that? 300 kilos. <laughs> oh, mean, okay, okay, I mean, gotcha. 200 kilos. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, gotcha. So 200 to make 200. There's no, you're not stretching it. No, that's what, uh, that's that's a myth that they painted, you know, that the crack was cheap and inexpensive. Right. Uh, I, I mean, it got cheaper. Right. You know, then right. when I first started, you know, the first kilo I bought, I paid 48,000 for it. Right. Uh, the last kilo I bought was like 9,500. Yeah. So wow. it got cheaper. Yeah. But it wasn't, it wasn't this cheap high like everybody like, was saying on the news. Right, right. So 300, 200, 300 kilos of crack. How many people do you have? How many trap houses do you have? How many people do you have helping you cook the stuff? Because you got to sell it too. No, we cook it at one spot. Wow. We, we, we finally, first it was, it, was, it was painful cooking. You know, we used to cook, we used to cook in mayonnaise jars. We used to go get mayonnaise jars and we, 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 we weren't that smart. So we would go to the grocery store, we'd get mayonnaise jars, dump all the mayonnaise out. We didn't have enough sense to go to the wholesaler who make jars and buy the right. jars from them. We would go get the mayonnaise jars. And then finally somebody turned us on to the beakers. Right. You know, where you go to a uh, chem lab and buy the beakers. And then right. we started with quarter pound beakers. And then we started with five gallon beakers. Wow. And then... Uh, one day I go into this restaurant and I see them with these great big pots and they're cooking all this food. And I was like, holy, that'd be great to cook crack in. <laughs> <laughs> so how much, how much Coke do you dump in one of those big- Like 40 kilos. 40 kilos in one pot. Yeah. So are you stirring it with like a boat's oar? It looks like, like a boat's oar. It's a spoon. They got, they got those industrial spoons. So we'd have one of those industrial spoons. Uh, I remember guys, they, 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 they want to take a picture of the rocks. I said, hell no. Nah. Yeah, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. we used to have rocks like, like this thick and, and like that big around. Like glaciers, like, yeah. like pieces of glacier ice. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I, I imagine a whole house could get somebody high. Like, unless oh, yeah. you're- we, 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 before, before, before uh, I knew that we were getting high, we would just be in there with no masks on. Right. But then eventually we started using the, the, the respirators. Wow. Uh, like because- a hospital- no, no, the ones like you paint cars. Oh, gotcha. Right, right. Because, you the, know, I painted cars. So, yeah. So I knew that, oh, well, these here protect you from the paint. So they'll probably protect you from inhaling yeah. cocaine. Because we couldn't sleep, you know. We, right. We, we would be up. Like, right. We, we, we had got hip to the cops. Was The cops had started raiding about six in the morning. Oh, okay. You know, they catch you when you sleep. So right. what we did is we started cooking probably from about two in the morning. And then we would be finished about four thirty, five o'clock. Right. And then get it all out of the house. Get it out of the house, put it in the back of the wow. car, have everything stacked up for the next day. So you've got 200 kilos of crack 
Uh, and then how many guys are you getting that off to? Mm, I don't know. Probably, we probably had about 15, 20 guys. And this is all still local in LA, right? Oh no, these guys would come from all over. Okay, great. So let's, this is a perfect uh, opportunity to talk about how the Crips uh, expanded. They, you know, began in LA, but they began to basically franchise or export all over the country. Crips and the Bloods. Crips and the Bloods. Uh, you know, somebody could take an ounce of Coke, uh, buy it in Los Angeles for, you know, the cheapest in the country, take it to St. Louis and boom, now he's a junior kingpin. Yeah. I, and, I, I was selling in St. Louis. St. Louis is where I caught my first federal case at. Okay. Save that. Cause we're definitely going to get into that. Uh, but you have, now you have workers, you, you call them workers, but are they just guys that are buying from you? Yeah. They just buy customers. Right. Right. So you have people. And then I created my customers too. You know, I would, I would, I would grow guys. Right. You know, I would, I would look for guys that was in the same position that I was in. You know, when I used to ask the pimps, "Hey, put me down, put me up." Right. So I, I used to look for guys that, uh, uh, that was like that. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Know? Um, you called it giving <coughs> micro loans. You, you were kind of the bank. Yeah. You know, because they didn't have money. Right. You know, and this was selling crack was it's different today, but back then it was a real viable economic option for somebody from the hood that didn't have a lot of opportunity. Oh, absolutely. A lot of people started businesses with, from selling crap. Right. And do you know, like, you, you obviously didn't, didn't get away with it, but there had to have been some guys who made some quick money and got out the game. Yeah, there was a few. You know? Because there was there's a few. millions of dollars were going through the streets. Very disciplined guys. Those guys right. were, like, really, really, you know, they would set a number for themselves. Uh, me, I, I, I tried to quit a couple times, my problem was is that some of my friends didn't didn't get in on time, and so they was like, "Oh man, you can't quit. You gotta right. Just do this for me. You, you gotta know? put me down. Yeah, just put me down. And, and what made you different? What made you the guy? Is it because you had the best price? Because you had the best connect? Well, all of that played a part in it, you know. And saving my money, I, I think saving the money probably was 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 the key. You know, having having cash money on hand, yeah. uh, is 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 like king. You know, right. Um, because now you don't work for anybody. You control yeah, your own fate. You know, once I got into the Nigger Robin Connection, they 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 started like going against each other. You know, like they would come by the house. Man, you know, he's charging you too much money. Right. Um, I can give it to you cheaper. Now you are becoming almost more powerful than your own connects yeah. because they need you so bad because you're moving it so fast. So now you've got. And that was my strategy too. I right. wanted to be. I wanted them to depend on me. Remember, I told you. Yeah. You know, I should like when they go buy a business for their wife or or buy a new car. You know, when I see them do that, you know, I should tell the homies. Oh, he he biting right into what we want to do. <laughs> wow. And you didn't learn this from anybody. That's the thing. You didn't see. It doesn't seem like you really grew up watching business, even street no, business guys. No, I just picked it up. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, when you're dealing, when you're dealing in cocaine, crack, you're dealing with some really smart people. You know, people who were buying cocaine for me was pretty smart. Mm -hmm. You know, my pimps, you know, they can make a woman go out there and, 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 and they believe that they could get almost any woman to go yeah. out and sell her body. Yeah. So you're talking about guys that are smart. Yeah. And then you're talking about lawyers and yeah. doctors and, yeah. you know, these are, these are like the upper echelon people. Right. So they teaching me business, uh -huh. even right. though they may not have been purposely trying right. to do it, but I'm learning from right. them as I go. And, and then, you know, I, I, I wanted to know, you know, I, I wanted right. to, to have right. a game. Yeah. And I learned from tennis too, you know, from yeah. tennis, uh, like when I started playing tennis, I didn't have money to take lessons. But Larry and Troy and 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 those guys were taking lessons. They they had sponsors that was paying for them to go take lessons. So I would go to them when they take their lessons, and I would just watch and learn from 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 yeah. what, what they were getting taught. Right. So I, I kind of become kind of like a, a guy that could copy. Right. You know what I saw. Totally. And I think tennis also opened up your world a little bit. Like I think sometimes uh, <coughs> you know guys in the hood, their world is so insulated. You oh know? yeah. Like oh, I yeah. think tennis and going to Dorsey, going to which is an affluent Baldwin Hills, I think that, you know, I think the best drug dealers, the best businessmen always have a bigger worldview. 
and they're able to associate with people of means at a younger age and see what's possible. Yeah, tennis think, opened so many doors for me. Yeah. I, I got to go places that that I didn't even, you know, Beverly Hills. I had never heard of Beverly <laughs> Hills. And now I'm in somebody's backyard playing tennis, you yeah. know? How wild is that, uh, right? Yeah. It's so, inspiring. It is. It is. And and you're getting to see like, oh, people ain't living like us. Right. You know, these people got, I, I used to play with this kid, uh, Jonathan Canner. His his grandfather was the owner of Orbex. And the tennis coach knew that I didn't have money. So mm-hmm. He set me up where I would go up there and they would pay me like $20 an hour to, to play with this kid. Good and money. when you see, they got a tennis court house that was bigger than our house and they sitting out on the balcony and they got waiters yeah. and, wow. and you're like, wow, yeah. people live like this here and their house look like a park. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. this is what I want. Did I'll- you Did you think you were going to get that when the crack started booming? Was that your goal to get out and live like no, that? No, I didn't think I when I started selling crack, um, I had my mindset had left tennis. Mm-hmm. I I'd become a low rider. Yeah. yeah. Well what did you have a number in mind? Did you have like okay five thousand got- dollars? When me and Al started, <laughs> we wanted five thousand dollars. That's what we wanted. We <laughs> and was that was going, good enough. Yeah, I was gonna get get my car finished from from the skill center, uh, paint it. Mike was gonna paint it, the guy who introduced me to cocaine. He was yeah. gonna paint my car for me. I was going to get my interior. I was going to go buy some rims. It cost $2,000. Mm-hmm. And I was going to live in my mama's garage for yeah. the rest of my and life. You, and you made it. I made it. Okay. So then, and then when you got your first million, what was the goal after that? Did you have a number? Did you say, okay, 50 million? Because you're bringing in like a million a day. Well, well you know, it got so easy, right? Yeah. You like, like I was telling you, one day you're making $20 a week. And then next thing you know, you're making that every day. Yeah. Then you're making 100 a day. Then you're making 5000 a day. And it just kept growing. Right. So when I was up to a million bucks, you know, I'm probably making 100000 a day without right. even thinking about it. Right. You know, the, the, the money is really making the money. Yeah. You know, all I had to do was go buy the cocaine, bring it to South Central LA, yeah. let everybody know I had it. Yeah. And they would come and buy it. Okay. So certainly, so now you've got people coming from Texas, Ohio. You said Cincinnati was one of the best markets. Why was Ohio such a good crack market? Because the price was high. Price was high. Totally. Uh, Ohio, you got- St. Louis. St. Louis, probably where I sold the highest kilo. I think I sold one kilo for 68000 Wow. And, and is that a kilo of crack? No, it was powder. Okay. So when guys were coming from out of town to pick up from you, a lot of these are a lot of these gang members from LA that you knew as a kid that have now gone to different markets. Both. Okay. Were they so if somebody was coming to pick up to re up from you and they lived in Kentucky, would you sell them powder or would you would it already be cooked up for them? According to what they asked for. According to what they asked for. I give them what they want. Okay. So it'd be what so it could be a, a both. Yeah. Now would did you charge more for the cook up because you had to do the labor? No. Uh uh-uh. uh. Okay. Interesting. This is Wow, I had no idea the the economies work the same way. But I assume they they make a lot more money when they sell it out in little crack stones than they would if they well the, 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 sold the rock off just makes it easier powder. to sell than the powder. Right. You know, powder is is loose. And, yeah, you know, a rock you can put in your hand and 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 roll it around. But also, powder. it's the ghetto drug, so it's an easy thing to market when you take it back to black neighborhoods. You know, and I know a lot of white people start coming down. Did you have any affluent white people that sold? I didn't really sell for white you? people. I didn't okay. sell white people. Okay. I didn't need to. Yeah. No. I, 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 I built my own clientele. Yeah. You know, I, I took my guys. Like what I did it, uh, one day, we, we, when I, when I'm, I'm still small in it at this time, but all of my guys that I hung out with, you know, from my neighborhood mm-hmm. that we play football and we all grew up together, I called them all over my mom's house, probably about 20, 25 guys. Wow. And I sit him in the backyard and I talk to him. I'm, I'm giving a seminar. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm telling him about how I got started. Yeah. You know, um, and I'm telling him that I'm getting ready to give all of them what I started with, which was three grams. Wow. And if they did what they were supposed to do, then they would make it. I also told them not to, not to smoke. You know, yeah. I schooled them on smoking. Like, if you smoke it, this stuff is so good. You're not going to stop. Yeah. Uh, and this was before we knew it was addictive, but we right. just thought it was just so great. It was right. the greatest feeling in the world. Did you ever smoke? I did a couple times. Yeah. And did you enjoy it? No. It, it made you feel tweaky or? I don't I don't even remember, you know, yeah. but it wasn't something that, uh, I, the main thing is that when, when I did, it was when I got my first ounce. Mm. And uh, 
everybody was telling me, oh, you rich, celebrate, you know, my cousins <laughs> and all that. So we did. They put in some weed and we yeah. we, we were smoking it. And, uh, when I look up a couple of days later, my money was gone. Mm, wow. And so I said to myself that I'm never going to do it again. Right. Yeah. Because a guy like you, a real money man, when anything messes with that money, you'll leave it alone. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what was your height? Your run, you have a, a run from about 81 to when you first get arrested in, I think, 88 or 89? 87. 87. What was, what, in those years, what was, what was the biggest year? 85, 86. Okay. What do you think you were doing? You know, the, the, they say a million a day. That's what the government alleges. Do you think you were moving about a million dollars a day? Every day, yeah. Every day. Mm -hmm. And you worked every day? That was easy. A million was easy a day. Yeah. So, so much money now you're purchasing. You don't spend money, but you invest it. You're buying properties, I'm right? buying properties. What, what did your property portfolio look like at its mm, height when you were making a million dollars? I think I like 15 million. What kind of properties? Motels, lots. I was building motels myself. Wow. So I had, I had bought lots. I was, I was getting ready to build four motels. That was going to be my exit. I was going to build four motels. I already had the one done and I had the, the, the lots and the plans and permits for two other ones that I, I matter of fact, I had started doing one already. I the, the bulldozer was over digging the holes and everything. Uh, I had another one in Long Beach that uh, it was an old rundown motel that I was buying. Uh, Did and, you own warehouses for, you know, uh, obviously to, to move this much cocaine takes stashes, traps, cooks, you know, places to put your money. I, I stashed in cars though. Oh, interesting. That's why the cops could never find the dope. Wow. So you take a million bucks, 5 million bucks and put it in, in the, the trunk of a car. Like we would get like, um, we would get apartment over in Westwood mm. with the underground parking. Right. And then we would just park the car in there. And you're over there in Westwood by UCLA. Yeah, the cops, safest neighborhood. They, they in never LA. thought they never thought we'd be over there. Then the dope, what we would do is like these little cheap motels that you see around here. Yeah, we would just pull the car up in that motel, rent the room, and leave the car there. This is brilliant. So now you have no fixed, you have no fixed place for them to get warrants. It's it seems like it's a constantly moving. Right, they uh, couldn't. That's why they started fabricating search warrants. Okay. Okay. We 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 kind of pushed the cops into going crooked. Okay. Great. So by eighty seven, you already have a. There is an LAPD task force dedicated solely to bringing you and Ollie, your partner, down. Yeah. Tell us about that. I, I didn't know about them until uh, they raided. They raided Merlin's house. One of my girlfriends. Okay. They raided her house. Uh, I was in St. Louis because I was setting up in St. Louis. I'm okay. like, shit, I can get sixty, $6,800 a kilo in St. Louis. I'm moving there. 68000 yeah. 68000 a kilo. And I'm I'm paying at that time maybe like 13000 a kilo. Wow. So I'm like- and how many kilos are you buying at a time? 100, 150, 200 sometimes. And, the, and how often are you re-upping? Probably every day. So you got about 200 bricks every day. And this is, you're dealing now- But that's for LA. <laughs> that was just for LA. That wasn't for St. Louis. St. Louis, I think I sent like, I think I sent like maybe 10 kilos down there the first time. Right. Uh, but LA was where, you know, LA was like the generator. Of course. This was the hub. Yeah. And I had set up a system here where I didn't need to be here no more. Right. You know, my guys could do everything, right. you right. know. Um, and I kind of felt like I wasn't needed anymore. Uh huh. You know, like, are you dealing with Blandone, Danilo Blandone now yeah, directly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and he, do you know, he was dealing with Pablo? He, his, his supplier was the Medellin I don't know cartel. He, I don't know who he was dealing okay. with. Okay. I, I, um, did you ever meet Pablo Escobar or any of the Colombians? No, I don't think so. Okay. I met, uh, he said, he said I met Manessis, but I don't even remember. I met so many of their friends. You know, we right. would go to the, to the, to the bar together, yeah. the restaurants and, then people would be there. And then some of those guys don't speak English. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't really know. And I wasn't caring anyway. No, you know? of course. Like he used to try to get me to go to Mexico with him. You know, come to Mexico. Let's, let's buy direct. And, you know, I was, I don't really, you know, I'm making enough money already. Right. You know, I make 200,000 right. profit a day. What, yeah. What more do I need? Right, right. You and know, and when you I'm buy- I'm a South Central boy that, that, right. that, you know, four or five years ago, I couldn't even put gas in my car. And now you've made it. Like you're, it's beyond your wildest dreams. Yeah, I probably got like 20 houses. And, 
you know, six or seven apartment buildings. I got the one motel. My motel, when I, when, when we first opened it, was making like 5000 a week itself. Just, legitimate. Yeah, legitimate like with, money. you know, renting, renting rooms, being, yeah. being a business. Mm -hmm. um, when you buy, are you buying 200 keys or do they give you some... No, I'm buying everything. I think I think the one time Danilo might have let me go with like thirty thousand dollars or something right. on a three million dollar deal. But you are your own man. They don't control you. No, no. You know, no, I, I should do to him. You know what I should do to him? I should stack all my money on the floor, like here. We'd be sitting here, and then I let him come in the house. <laughs> I call him. Hey, come by the house, and they come by, and the money be sitting there. And they what you going to do with that? And you know what I'm going to do? I'm buy dope today. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And, so we had somebody- And that's how I got my price down. Okay, gotcha. So you're paying about 13000 a key come around 1987. Yeah. Okay. This is dirt cheap cocaine. That's the highest quality. Not stepped on, I assume, as soon as it gets to Straight you. Straight off the boat. Yeah, this that's right. off the boat. That's right. You are your own man. Because uh, we had somebody in here who said, who claimed that they, you were a worker. So I just need to put that to rest. I was like, Rick Ross was not a worker. He was a boss. I'm a worker for myself. That's right. That's right. You were a distributor, but yeah. you you were never put on. You were never- uh, I wasn't fronted no dope. You weren't fronted any dope. No. That's right. So by 87, how did you tell us about this task force, this LAPD task force aimed at taking you down? Well, the first time I heard about him was- um, they uh, raided Maryland's house. Yeah. I was in St. Louis. Um, that raid caused me problems too. And uh, they said they found dope in her house and they took her to jail. And I was like, ain't no dope in that house. I never take no dope in here. So, you know, now I was kind of like, I wonder if she started using drugs. You know, you know, you, you're thinking like that there, right? Yeah. Like, so uh, we bail her out and I go see the lawyer and I'm telling uh, the lawyer that uh, that these cops are planting drugs. You know, I don't even know they lying on search once too. You know, that yeah. never crossed my mind right. that, they, that they also lying on search once. But uh, I just figured that, uh, you know, I would tell him and he was like, oh, cops don't, Alan Finster, oh, <laughs> cops don't plant drugs. What are you talking about? <laughs> are you crazy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is this blasphemy? A cop would never do anything dishonest. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then he, I mean, he just popped out and said, yeah, if they planted drugs on me, I would hire a private investigator. And I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea, Mr. Finster. So we hired a, a guy named Frenchie, who was an ex-sheriff. And uh, he's the one that came and told us that uh, the task force was called the Freeway Rick Task Force. Wow. And so you had this private, and how did you figure out that they, your hunch was right, that they were, in fact, uh, writing fake false search warrants. Well, we planning didn't know dope about the, We didn't even know about the search warrants. So it took a long time. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't, I could not, I couldn't fantasize a cop fabricating a search warrant. Mm. I mean, that's, that's some serious. Yeah. Corruption. That's some serious corruption. You fabricated a search warrant yeah. to go in somebody's house, you know, like, right. You could get the city could get sued up the yang yang or something like that right. there, you know. Uh, so so it, it, it was it was unbelievable that they would do that. But know? that was happening. It was happening. Yes. Wow. Uh, what about? Did you ever bribe the cops? Did you ever? No, pay I didn't cops know them. I anyway? never. I never had contact with them. Wow. The first time I had contact with them was um, one night. Um, for some reason, we couldn't get no drugs that night, and that day. And so it was like a day off, you know? So yeah. we, we, we go to the YMCA, me and, uh, me and Ali and, and Cornell, Coach Ward, uh, we, we go to, uh, right over here, right in fact, on King Boulevard. It was a YMCA right wow. there up in the jungle. So we go there and we play basketball. Yeah. I, I become a, a advocate basketball player. Okay. I mean, I, I was taking basketball lessons, you know, on how to shoot the ball. Wow. Yeah. My man, my man Onion was, was, was teaching me how to shoot the ball. And, um, he, he played in the NBA. I was working with him on his footwork from tennis and mm. he was showing me how to shoot the ball. So I was an advocate basketball player. So we were leaving there and we had left, we had left Cornell's car at, at Manchester Park. So I was taking him back to get his car and we were passing out Western where I used to have my tire and wheel shop and car washing stuff at. And we looked, I had these big glass windows at my place 
And we looked in and we saw all the guys like standing in the showroom. And I was like, oh man, everybody's there. Probably about 30 guys. Yeah. So uh, we go, we park in the alley. I hide my car. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of figured the sheriffs might know what my car looked like. Mm -hmm. so, so I hide my car in the alley and uh, we walk in and we, we, we talking to everybody and, you know, just shooting it, shooting it, the normal. Yeah. So when I got ready to leave, they break the dice game up and everybody walked me out. And they walked me back to the alley where my car was at. Well, apparently the sheriffs had just raided. It's crazy. They had one of my guys in the car with them. Uh, and he, he told me the whole story. And they was just like, he said, they say, oh, let's pass by a big palace. You know, after the raid, yeah. after they raided his house, they was like, let's pass by a big palace. And so when they passed by, they saw me. Oh, I see. They saw right. me. Right. And uh, we walked and got in the car. And uh, anyway, we had a high speed chase. You know, they chased me in the wow. car. Now, why would you why would you run from the cops? You're richer than God at this point. Because they told me they're going to kill me. Wow. They didn't put the word out that they're going to kill me. They had just raided Ali's house like two weeks before. Yeah. And they put a plastic bag over his head. Because, you know, we had these big safes in the house. Yeah. Even though we didn't keep money in them no more. But we still had these safes in the house. So, you know, Ali was, you know, Ali was was a hard nose. You know, he was yeah. like, yeah, I ain't opening the safe for you. Even though it's nothing in there, he yeah. still wouldn't open the safe for him. He not going to cooperate with him at all. So they took him and put a plastic bag over his head. Holy. Yeah. So, this is the LAPD. And the sheriffs, both. Wow. You know, they took, you know, the Freeway Task Force was like two of the most elite cops from all around this area. Wow. So they took the two most elite Narcotic agents from 77, 108, yeah. Linwood, Firestone, and they put all these guys together and, and they became this elite task force. Just to take down you and Ollie. Well, they they, they did more than just yeah. us, but because uh, um, they had a track record of taking down guys. I mean, yeah. you know, they took down everybody they went after. Who, who right. going to beat them? Right. They brought the drugs with them. Now, now did they- How do you beat that? Were th was there evidence of them jacking drugs and then reselling them? Nobody ever accused them of reselling the drugs. No. Well, because I'm trying to figure out- But what they did do, if they would raid you and you would have more kilos than they needed to, to give you the kind of time they would do, they would take those kilos out. Yeah. And then they would put those kilos on me. Right. Like now you got it. You're doing time for this. Right. Okay. So because this all comes into play when you first get arrested- you take you you avoided this task force. They never took you down. No, they never pinned anything on you. No, um, they can. They never caught me. Right, because I got the that night they we had the high speed chase. I yeah. get away. Oh, you got away? Yeah. Well, what did you caught. drive? Didn't you drive like a Saab or something? A station wagon. A, I had station, a station wagon. wagon. <laughs> <laughs> I had a station wagon. But, Dude, you are an but artist. I, I beat them though. You know, because I knew the you know I know the streets. So yeah. I, I just did like a little 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 thing that that I was taught from you know, from stealing cars, you know, they taught me like go in the backyard one way and then come back out on the other side of the house and they usually going to miss you. Right. And, you know, I did one of those little maneuvers Yeah. and I got away from them. Yeah. But they caught Al again. Right. You know, beat him in the head again. So Al had told me that they wanted to kill me. And uh, matter of fact, when they pulled on the side of our car, because they pulled on the side of us before, you know, before we took off and, you know, he let his window down and, and we could see his his patch on the, on the thing. And it mm -hmm. was the police because I was going to shoot. I had his gun. He was ready to start. She was like, if they jack us, I'm going I'm to give it to him. And then he said, oh, that's Tomar. And and uh, we all knew who Tomar was. Tomar was, uh, his nickname was Diablo the Devil. Wow. And he was the head of the task force. Wow. And he sounds like a killer. Sounds mm -hmm. like a mean son of a bitch. Yeah, he was pretty At mean. very least. He was pretty mean. Now, at this time, you didn't carry a gun. No, I didn't. You carry? I mean, I I did sometimes. Yeah, I, I, like if I go to the if I go to the skating ring or if I go to a club or something like yeah. that, there where I know, uh, uh, I would be in a vulnerable place. Yeah. Now in South Central, I didn't carry a gun. Right, because you moved with bodyguards when you were in South no, Central. I didn't right? have no bodyguards. No. Okay, I'm just reading. I'm just reciting your Wikipedia page because there's a lot of. Mm, Myths but people out there. put that on there, and I I didn't feel like I needed a bodyguard in South Central. Plus, you know, I, I kind of uh, 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 I I be kind of like hard to see. Why? Because you know, your stature. People just don't see me, right? You know, they didn't see You're me. You're a very low key guy. <laughs> 
Yeah, so I look guy. like everybody, you know. But but this, I, I find it fascinating because you operated with a total business mind. Like you're, and this is not to dish you, it's your, it's known. Sometimes you would get jacked. People would jack you for keys and you would say, let them go. You would not jack me for keys, but they would run off with a key. <laughs> run off with a key. <laughs> yeah, but, I'd give it to them. One of my models was, is that if I give it to them, they didn't take it. Right. I gave it to him. Right. So then not only you don't really lose respect and. Well, I didn't really care about how people look at how I do my business, you know, by me not uh, uh, um, being hard nosed like that. Yeah. Um, I looked at it as smart business, you know, yeah. say for instance, <clears throat> you know, somebody might owe us. Two hundred thousand dollars, and then the guys want to go and 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 do whatever to them. I'm like, okay, if we go do that, now I'm gonna have to bail all y'all ass out of jail. Mm -hmm. You know, that's gonna be fifty hundred thousand dollars a piece. I'm gonna have to go hire Alan Finster. You know, if you come to his office, he want fifty thousand. Yeah, just you know, to talk to you. Yeah, just to right. talk to you. And then if you go to trial, it's gonna be a hundred thousand. Right. So now you're talking about for for two hundred thousand, we're probably gonna wind up spending five or six hundred thousand dollars trying to keep your ass out of Doesn't jail. Doesn't make any sense. And now that sense. guy who ran off with the keys, guess what? He gets paid once. Now hmm. now what's he going to do? So, but most drug dealers, kingpins don't think like that. But that's a, you know, I was the same way when I was out in the streets. Yeah. Uh, and I think too, your lack of violence, I mean, I don't know how many bodies were linked back to, you know, people that worked with you or sold your product. But I think that probably helped in when you got resentenced back in the 90s from your life sentence. I think that probably helped you get a lower uh, sentencing guideline. Well, definitely. Violence, you know what I mean? Violence definitely plays a part in, in the sentencing uh, guideline mechanism. Uh, but it gives you goodwill in the community. Totally. You know, the community appreciates you when, you, you know, you didn't, uh, you wasn't a bully. Right. You know, because you could be a bully if you wanted to. Totally. You, you had know? enough money to be a bully. I mean, I could be a bully right now. Yeah. You know, I know the guys, you know, some of my friends just getting out of prison, you know, 45 years when I'm dead. You know, went to jail wow. when he was like 18 years old and, yeah. and he's really a maniac. Yeah. You know, uh, and he hangs out at my house. You know, he comes by my house almost every day because we, you know, we went to school together, junior high school. And, you know, I had to keep guys like that. Oh, man, stay cool. Don't mm -hmm. do nothing. Stay out of jail. Yeah. You know, uh, so it's easy to be a bully. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, when you're from South Central, it's easy to be a bully. It's plenty of guys around there that want to win points, you know. Yeah. And, and for them, you know, shooting a gun or killing somebody, they feel like that's that's easy work. Was anybody mad? Was anybody jealous that this, you know, short guy, short, unassuming tennis player, you know, didn't have any girls back then. He was kind of, you know, just kind of like the, almost like the younger brother figure. Were they mad that he had now blown up to be the biggest, biggest dealer they in America? They wouldn't tell me that though. <laughs> no, of course not. But they said you walked around with a vest, with a bulletproof vest on. So well, clearly a, you knew you had some it, enemies. It was a time that, that, uh, it was a little rumor out that all of the drug dealers, you know, some of them I helped come up and had got together and they was like, man, Rick's selling cocaine too cheap. You know, he's taking all the customers. <laughs> right. You know, let, let's let's get rid of him. <laughs> right. Did you take that seriously? Did I you did. Think? I did, yeah. I so mean, you started to move. Because you never know how, you know, how other people, you know, they mind be twisted sometimes. So yeah. I started wearing a bulletproof vest and I started carrying my gun a little more. Yeah. Did, were you the dis exclusive distributor for the Nicaraguans in Los Angeles, or do they have other customers? I don't know. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. During that time, during that run, did you ever suspect that your Nicaraguan suppliers were being protected by the government? No, I didn't think they liked the government. Okay. This is important because later on, I mean, you had no idea about Iran-Contra during the 80s when you were moving all, the, all these drugs but a lot of your drug money that you were given to them, they were buying guns uh, and sending them to Nicaragua with the help of the CIA. Correct. So you were part of this historical drama that you weren't even aware of at the time. Correct. Wow. So 87, you catch your first case, a Fed case. Uh, you no, know, I caught my first Fed case in 80, maybe 84, maybe. Might have. I beat the case though. 
You beat your Fed case in 84? I beat my first Fed case. Where yeah. was that? Out here? St. Louis. Okay. You beat it in St. Louis, but the first time you actually go to prison. No, uh, I didn't go to prison until 89. And that was- a, I go to, I go to, I get arrested in 87 from the, from the, from the sheriffs, the okay. crooked cops. They okay. arrested me in 87. Okay. I only do about 40 days on that case though. What are the, do they have anything on you? They planted the drugs, but remember- they had never saw me, right? So what they did is I turned myself in. It was so crazy the day I turned myself in. We, we in the courtroom, right? And uh, I've been all over the news because the cops said I shot at them. You know, they, they put on the news, I shot at the cops. Okay, so they lied too. They lied. They shot at me, but they said I shot at them first because they shot. When they were shooting, they shot in these people's house. This is during the high speed? Yeah, this is during the high wow. speed. So I jump out the car and run, and they start shooting at me. Bang, bang, bang. So they shoot up in these people's house. And then they put on the news that I shot first. Right. So my mom is crying, and she, she, she wants me to turn myself in because I'm all over the news. Shoot to kill, dangerous, you know, be careful. Wow. So my mom called me. She's crying. Oh, baby, turn yourself in. Um so I said, all right. And I called Alan Fincher. And I was like, man, I'm gonna turn myself in. Can you set up everything? Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to turn myself into these cops, though. I want to go straight to the judge, right? Because I already know these cops are ruthless. I don't want no plastic bag over my head. Right. I don't right. want to you know. No, you know, I don't want to go through all that. Right. I don't want to get hit in the head with no flashlights. Yeah. I don't want none of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Then me going to the judge. You know, I'll be good. So he set it up, and uh, we in the courtroom. We in the hallway. And uh, my friend is sitting down the hall and he's like, these cops. And he said, they kept saying, man, that guy down there looked like Ricky Ross. <laughs> 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 and then he come and tell me, so I just go in the courtroom. Because they can't arrest you in the courtroom, but they can get you in the hallway. Okay. If you're in the hallway of the courtroom, right. the cops can arrest you. But once you step inside the courtroom, they can't do it. So I just went inside the courtroom after he told me what they were saying. They was looking at me. Um so I turned myself in, the judge, take me into custody. I'm hoping I get a bail, right? Yeah, and right. He, he gives me a bail, a million dollars, but he put a 12, 1255 on it. You know, normally- Which is me, what? 1255, meaning that all the money, all the property, everything has to go under a, a investigation. You know, they have to verify that it was not drug money, uh, that the property yikes. is not- Right. Uh, uh, you know, derived- Purchased from, with drug, drug money. money. Right. So, we do that. So I go to jail. They take me to the county jail. I can't bail out, you know, because of the 1255. Right. Um, and they're, they're, you're being charged with shooting at cops? Shooting at cops and selling. They planted drugs too. Okay. How many, how many, tell us about that. They planted two kilos on me. Uh, in the car where, or in the house where they arrested you? No, they didn't arrest me. They never arrested oh, me. So how do they plant you with drugs when you're not even, not, not even on your person? Yeah. What they say happened is when I jumped out the car, I dropped. My guys, they say they, 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 where, where I, cause when I jumped out the car, Cornell said he put the car in park, stopped the car and put it right. in park. Cause I let the car running. It was mm -hmm. rolling when I jumped out. Um, I think they're going to kill me. So I'm running for my life. Yeah. It's not just, I'm trying to get away. I'm yeah. running for my life. So, uh, Cornell put the car in park. He said, once they cuffed him up and everything, they put the kilos right by the door of the car where the door was open. They took wow. pictures of it and said, wow. I dropped the bag as I dropped out. The judge, the judge, he he kind of he kind of roasted him too because the judge was he was like, why would the head guy jump out with the dope? He got two of his underlings in there, <laughs> right, right. And then they said when 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 they followed me out the shop, they said I had a gun too. So when when we walked out with like thirty guys, the judge scolded him about this, and he said, so you telling me that Mr. Ross walked out with thirty guys and he was the one carrying a gun, <laughs> right? And this is the same guy that you guys been in here telling me all these, how smart he is and how brilliant he is and that you guys can't catch him. Yeah. He said, keep telling your story. Wow. So the judge is already- Doesn't before, believe these cops. He doesn't, he doesn't believe them. He's wow. already questioning their, their credibility already. Wow. So when they took me back to the county jail, the cops come to the county jail. Are you in LA downtown? Yeah. Okay. And they took me back into a little room and they interviewed me. And that's what killed that case. So they they recorded this conversation too. So when they when they when they turned the tape in, the tape was all spliced and cut up. And um, 
they should have called my lawyer and told my lawyer that they wanted to come and see me, you know, and got his permission. They just violated so much stuff. So the judge was like, this is an embarrassment to, 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 to the thing. And the prosecutor, he still argued, try to keep the case. And the judge was like, you should be glad that you didn't have nothing to do with this. You wow. Know? And, Cause and they, th- they were, I mean, it was a complete uh, mishandling of the process. Everything was. How, what, what was that in, investigate? What was that interrogation like? It was rough. Did they beat you up? <laughs> they did. They did. And they recorded it too. Why yeah. would they do that? These they sound was, like the dumbest cops. They was dumb. Wow. I mean, if I was a cop, I could have got me. Yeah. You know, for would, sure. You could have got you. Yeah. It probably took, you know, a month, yeah. you know, maybe a little work. Yeah. You know, put in a little work, take right. do a little time, a little, yeah. you know, do your job. Right. You right. know what I'm saying? Don't don't just try to come and circumvent your job and, yeah. and and take a shortcut. And and that was a problem that I had with these cops is that they weren't really they were they weren't willing to do their job. They was willing right. to take a shortcut to to get the end result. That they and wanted. so they were trying to beat a confession out of you. That's what that interrogation was about. Yeah, but they didn't want. I mean, they they couldn't have wanted that tape to to to, to be played to court. surface. Yeah. Wow. Well, and you know what's so fascinating about this time is like, if this were today, that would be the DEA. It wouldn't be local cops. It would be chasing a guy making, you know, $200,000 a day. So that- I think back then though, they were saying, you know, because one of the cops, you know, we interviewed one of the cops on the documentary for my documentary. Yeah. And he said that nobody believed that we were making that kind of money. Yeah. I believe him though. That's, it's unbelievable because I think when it was in the 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 crack era really started to boom, it was such a a phenomena to where you. I mean, it's like it's stunning. It's stunning. Uh, now in history, we can we can look back at history now and be like, oh yeah, there were there were probably a few Rick Rosses, you know. Uh, but yeah, when you're in it at the time, it just seems like too crazy to believe. But moving on. You eventually go to prison when they get you, where they, they put a, a case on you for some kilos that had to do with St. Louis and Texas. Uh, where you caught the two strikes in no, one. No, no, that was Cincinnati and, and Texas. Okay, I'm sorry, Cincinnati and Texas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, quickly, what, what happened? How many keys did they get you, put you, put uh, you with? Cincinnati, Cincinnati. Uh, they, 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 the first indictment said 40, 40, 40 some kilos a month was what Cincinnati said. Okay. On the first indictment. Did they actually get you with any dope? No, no dope. Okay. You know, the feds don't really need dope. Right. So they just got you on a racketeering case, essentially snitches. Yeah. People, people saying, saying that, that they you, saw you at this, got at this it. time. Okay. And estimating how many kilos you moved a month. Right. And you were able, so they originally were going to, what were you looking at for that? What were you originally mm, looking I, at? I could have probably got it. I could have probably got a life sentence in Cincinnati. Right, right. Because they were saying 49 kilos a month for, for a year, year and a half. Yeah. So you're talking about if you add that up, uh, you're talking about 400 and something kilos. Right. Uh, maybe, maybe, you know, 20, 30 years I could have gotten. Yeah, easily, easily. Because by now the statutes, the federal statutes are giving that kind of time away to kingpins. Yeah. Um, you got two strikes two federal strikes, which I didn't even know there were strikes in the feds. Um, you got two strikes for this crime. Uh, for that one in Texas, my cousins in Texas got indicted. I had two twin cousins that I had started out and they got pretty big. Yeah. And uh, they got arrested in Texas. And uh, They turned on you? Mm-mm, nope. One had called me. Um uh, and was asking me for some cocaine. Mm. Uh, I was mad at them, though. You know, they had been going other places. And I was like, ah, I ain't messing with y'all no more. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when he called me, he was like, man, you got anything? I was like, no, nah, I ain't got nothing. But they indicted me anyway. Oh, so they were tapping his phone? His phones was tapped, yeah. Wow. So he- one of my guys that used to be one of my guys was serving him. So when they arrested him and them, they said, oh, no. He said no, but he sent Chris. Wow, and that was enough. They indicted me for that. Yeah. Wow, and and I was looking at forty years, and they made me a deal for for ten years, uh, where I would only have to do five. So I took the deal. Now, did you? Even though I was innocent, right? I was innocent of that case, but uh, but the two strikes. This is important to your story because <coughs> later on, back when you caught your your case, that in was 95, my second strike. 
That, yeah. And but I was really innocent of that case, though. Right. I just took the deal because it made sense. Yeah. It made sense to do five years rather than take a chance on doing 40. Yeah, especially when you're going up against the feds. Now, did you actually end up cooperating against those cops in exchange for a lower sentence? Yeah, I did. Not for not really for a lower sentence, but... Uh, the cops, I'm sorry, the LA, the task force cops. Yeah. 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 I, I, I had already... I mean, that was my investigation. I started that investigation. So that was really my investigation. Yeah. So yeah, I I, uh, I hired the investigator who who gave them all the evidence that they used. You know, he he right. was he was the guy who gave them all the witnesses and everything. So that was my investigation. And so, did those cops end up going to prison? I think six did. Wow. Thirty thirty five got suspended. Yeah. And six actually went to prison. Wow. Short so, short periods of time. Right. Uh, it's really hard to get jurors to. Uh, go against cops for known uh, felons, especially back then. Especially yeah. back then. Yeah. yeah, yeah, really back then. Even probably even worse. So everybody who testified against the cops, you know, were gang members yeah. and drug dealers. Right. And so you know, yeah, it's hard because they're not. It's criminals that are testifying right. against them. It's yeah. So the credibility is uh, is is low, but you were telling the complete truth because. Look what right. happened to you. Exactly. So you you do about five years, a little less than five in the feds. You get out. Do you say I'm done? Like I were was you good? done. I was done. I was done with cocaine. I had uh, I've been looking at the music business. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, me and Harry O's with Sellies when they started Death Row. So I'd already been looking at the music business. Who's Harry O's? Harry O. Who is that? He's the guy that that started Death Row with Shield Knight. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So me and him were Sally. So I was there when they started Death Row. Wow. Okay. We were Sally's when they started Death Row. Wow. So I saw what happened with the music business. So I said, you know what? I'll just do some music. And I already had some music connections too. Yeah. You know, I've been messing with Otis Smith, who um, I knew from back my tennis days. Um, Otis had in introduced me to Dick Griffey and Barry Gordy. So I had those contacts already. Yeah. Uh, I just needed to uh, put them in put them into play. And now while you were gone, obviously you famously purchased a theater, right? And South yeah, the Central. Yeah, theater right there on Crenshaw and Adams. Right. Okay. And so you want to, you know, develop this and renovate it, but it's, you're bleeding money at this point. You're spending a lot of money when you're locked Well, when up. I got out of prison, I bought that before I went to prison. Right. Yeah. I put 900,000 down on it uh, before I went to prison. Yeah. And I owed 300 on it. Um, and the terms, we hadn't negotiated the terms or nothing. The contracts wasn't done. You know, I literally just gave them the money yeah. without the contracts being done. And then my girlfriend was supposed to finish the deal for me. You know, well, she wasn't supposed to finish the deal. But once I went to prison, I was getting her to finish the deal for me. Right. And she wasn't really motivated to 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 do all the stuff. And anyway, they gave me a terrible, terrible terms yeah. on, on the money. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was going to be, I wanted to make that like the West Coast Apollo. I felt that that would give me a, a, a toehold on the rap game. Right. It probably would have, for sure. Yeah, it would have been, sure. it would have been the place, the place held like 4,500 people. Yeah. So it would have been the place that rappers come through yeah. and sell out and yeah, maybe even their careers break from that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, was a great idea. Um, unfortunately, when you're in prison, you don't have a lot of you rely on everybody on the outside to do their jobs. And a lot of people they don't. just don't do it. No, they leave you for dead. <laughs> right. Exactly. Now, what about all your hotels and your houses and your properties? Did you lose those when you went yeah, away? Yeah, Family wouldn't collect rents and it was, just, it was trouble. You know, I'm getting letter from one letter after another one, a foreclosure, foreclosure. So you didn't really set up your legitimate infrastructure very well, the way that you had your crack empire. I didn't know. I didn't know nothing about business. I never right. did business. You right. know, I never took Section 8 checks before. Yeah. All that stuff was new to me. Right, right. And, and it happened to you so fast at such a young age. It doesn't seem like you really had time and to my mom, And my mom, she didn't, you know, my mom was yeah. on welfare. So she right. didn't really know either. And, you know, none of my relatives, you know, nobody, I didn't have nobody to say, hey, let's get a McDonald's, you know. Right. Let's buy a couple of McDonald's. Let's, let's, or let's buy something that, that, that made sense. Everybody... Yeah. Well, now, you know, when I when I look back at my life, everybody around me was just basically feeding off of me. Yeah. You know, not coming with, with, with ideas. And that's kind of like, you know, where I'm at now today. You know, now I know to go and get people like Deidre. That's right. Why, right. So Deidre's with me because right. I know, 
she knows her business. Yeah. You know, she she she'll keep me on the right track, right. you know, because I'll stay on the right track if I know what track I'm supposed to be on. Yeah. You know, I'll get on the wrong track too. Yeah. But when you have people that uh uh really have your best interests at heart and really want to see the business thrive, yeah. you know, uh for the sake of the business and and not just there to to take everything that, right. that you can they can get from you. Yeah. yeah. And that's what what's happening with me. Even all my friends that I grew up with, yeah. they they became more takers than 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 givers. They, well probably because the money comes so easily when you're in the game like that that you're not forced to develop, you know, greater business skills. Because correct. look, it's white dope, dirty money. It's the easiest it's thing to do. It's a crutch. Right. It's a crutch. Um and definitely when you got out of prison this time, I think you were taken advantage of by people in the legitimate world. Um, so I'm glad to see that you're doing so well and that we're going to plug these ventures and these things you have going on at the end. But, you know, we have to talk about after you got out of prison in the 90s, you were good. You said you, you weren't going to go back to the game. You were determined to not go back to the game. Uh, you were, I think you were like, what were you doing? You had like some menial job when you came home. Yeah, I was uh, doing cleanups on on construction sites. Cleanups on construction sites. Gone from making a million dollars a day to now. Did that crush your soul a little bit? Nah, money don't money don't make me. No, it doesn't. I can tell that. No, when I was in prison with no money, I still was like I'm Rick Ross. Yeah, because you have this mind. You develop this strength of character. Then all I know from I'm your a mind. win. I'm a win. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna do what it takes to win. But, but. Still in 95, your old friend, Danilo Blandon, who, you know, the head of the Nicaraguans in the 80s, trafficking coke in LA, he's working with the DEA. He approaches you and says, hey, I, I, I need to move some product. Why did you say yes? Well, it, 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 it took some time. It took six months. He, for him he, to convince you? Yeah, we, we did this for six months. And one day he called me at the right time. I was with Chico. Who was Chico? Chico, my crimey. Okay. And it was his money that that uh, that we put up. Right, because uh, he had a hundred bricks that he wanted to sell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a hundred that, that he was gonna sell. Um, and it just was easy, you know. Chico was there. Uh, Chico was willing to do it. You know, it was just an easy, an easy fix. The, the kilos were nine five. At that time, kilos was going for seventeen. My theater was in foreclosure. Right. I mean, it was it was you know everything was right there. You know, and yeah. and, and it, even even with the theater, I'd almost gave up on the theater before this. Yeah. You know, I'd almost say, you know what, I'm just gonna let the theater go. Yeah. You know, I can't I can't hold it. I'm just gonna just start over and just just build my life from there. Yeah. Um, and then I was messing with a lot of rappers. You know, I had a lot of rappers that was you know that was messing with me. You yeah. Know? Um. Cube a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, DJ Pooh, Chocolate, Ant Banks, you know, uh, all those guys were supporting my movement. Jinx, Sir yeah. Jinx. Yeah. So, so I knew that I could do it in the rap game. Right. You know. Right. Um, so you felt like, and how much did you stand to make off this deal? A couple hundred thousand? Yeah, probably a couple hundred. So that you thought, okay, this could, this could finally get the theater uh, off the ground. Yeah, it would and, it would definitely get it out of foreclosure. Yeah. I think it was like thirty thousand behind. Yeah, on the payment. Yeah, okay. So and you said, all right, let's do it. And and I really didn't have to do nothing. My mine was just the introduction. Introduction. Right. Right. And of course, you're in a parking lot in San Diego, and Danilo was supposed to be there, and the feds show up. No, he was there <laughs> with the he feds. Was, okay, he was there with the feds. He probably, they gave him a gun. He was a number one snitch, man. Yeah, he was there with the feds. I mean, how did that feel? Did you say, oh, my life's over? Like, what I felt like that because, you know, I knew the law. I've been in the feds, so yeah. I already knew the yeah. law. I have friends that got life sentences for the three strikes, so yeah. I already knew kind of what it was. So I jumped in the car and just took off, you know, hoping I could. Took off running. Maneuver. Yeah, yeah. Maneuver. No, uh, I jumped in the car. I was no, in the you car. took out, yeah, you, you you took him on a chase. Well, they 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 uh they blocked me off, so I wound up wrecking the truck and jumped out and started running and you know, had helicopters and yeah. everything. It was yeah. awesome. it was a setup. You know, the whole thing was a you know, I mean, 
and it's so silly to me, right? Like how our government would spend so much money to set me up. Yeah. But would spend no money to help me get set up. Right. You know, this there's just just the arrest probably cost them four hundred thousand dollars. Right. You know? Right. Like not to mention they they are creating the crime. They it's, created it's the crime. entrapment. Because I wasn't I wasn't selling drugs. I no. wasn't thinking about selling drugs. No. Uh I didn't want to sell drugs anymore. Right. Uh but you know, I was still an addict. You were addicted to money. Yeah. You're addicted to the game. And and to the cocaine. You know, the cocaine becomes the, the identification piece. You know? Your identity is right. your I'm I'm a drug kingpin. I'm right. I'm the guy. I totally get that. I need that crutch. Where that crutch at? Give it to me. Right. Uh, uh, right. I ain't standing up good right now. Right. Exactly. So, you know, you get that crutch and, and there it is. So it was really baffling to me that they would spend so much money to to create the crime and, and then it take us to trial. I think our trial cost like $3 million. Wow. I mean, did they, they didn't offer you a plea deal? No, they never offered me a deal. I tried to plead guilty to 20 years. Wow. And that, and by the way, for people who don't know, that is very, very rare that they don't offer, uh, you know, somebody in the feds arrested in charge of the federal crime. LJ O'Neill act like he was mad at me. You know, I don't know where who he was knew that? me from. That was the prosecutor. Okay. The U.S. attorney? Yeah. LJ O'Neill. He, he act like he was, I tried to plead guilty to 20. Yeah. You were putting your hand up like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll take 20. Yeah. You know, I, I want to go home so I can see my grandkids, right, you know, like, right. and, and I know, you know, I had friends that had life sentences from yeah. three strikes. So I already right. knew what it was going to be like. And yeah. I knew how hard it was to get three strikes off of you. So right. um, I was like, hey, give me 20, give me 20, mm -hmm. you know, and they was like, nah, go to trial, plead guilty. Whatever the judge gave you, that's what the judge gave you. So, so you actually, if they don't want to let you plead guilty, you have to go to trial. Right. That's wild. That's crazy. I mean, they reserve that only for the biggest kingpins. You know what I mean? So you go, you blow trial. I mean, it's a pretty open and shut case. You get sentenced to life. Well, you know what? One of the jurors almost held out on them. One wow, of the jurors didn't really? like, yeah, they didn't like what they did to me. Because it was such entrapment. It was such. They called me the first day I got out of prison. Wow. Yeah, I walk out of prison and now you offer me drugs. <laughs> I mean, like, what the. You got a call from Danilo the first day you got out of yeah. prison? Yeah. Wow. That's so crazy. They what about wanted... rehabilitation? You know, like, you don't give me a chance to rehabilitate? Did you make a statement to, to during the... sentencing? I did. I did. Yeah. But by that time, I had learned more about the law, and I knew that a life sentence wasn't what I should have got, you know? Yeah. So did, did you... Because I scolded the judge, the, the did, prosecutor. Did you think it, when you were getting sentenced to life, did you think... There might be a chance. Oh, no, I knew I was coming back. You knew you were coming back? I told the judge, I'll be back. And she said, I'll be waiting on you. Oh, wow. And when I came back, she said, you sold, you kept your word. And so you went back to that judge yeah. for the appeal? Mm hmm So you get, set, you get sent up in 96? Yep. Okay, you get sent up in 96. Uh, are you literate by this time? Oh, yeah, I'm reading well. So you, you've, you've taught yourself. You're in the law library. Every day, all every day. Every day. Every day. You went to day. law school in prison. Yeah, all I do is work out and, and go, to, go to the library. Yeah, yeah. And you're reading a ton, too. You're reading motivational books. You're reading business books. I mean, you're just- I'm cramming. I'm you're cramming. cramming. I'm you're cramming, cramming baby. for the final exam. I'm cramming. So how long does it take you to get, how long did it take you before you discovered this loophole that you should not have gotten that second federal strike from Texas? Well, it started with, 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 uh, Alan get a call from a INS agent and he was, I'm sorry, say that again. Alan Fincher, my lawyer, Your get lawyer. a call okay. from gotcha. at his hotel. We in trial. Okay. And he gets a call from this INS agent who won't identify himself or anything. And he says, I don't know what they did, but that guy they got testifying against Rick shouldn't be in this country. Mm. And so the next day we go to court, Alan comes in the holding tank and he's like, man, I get this strange call from this guy and the guy won't leave his name. It was really weird. And uh, I said, what did he say? He said, oh, Danilo shouldn't be in this country. He said a convicted uh, drug dealer can't, uh, uh, an illegal alien who gets convicted of a drug crime can't be in this country. And so we go to court and he's asking the judge, can we postpone the trial? Let me investigate the situation. I got this strange phone call. So the judge is like, no, 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 we're not going to do it. This trial has been going on. We're not going to let you go on no fishing expeditions. Um, you got to come with some type of evidence. 
So when I got from from court that night, I went to the library and I'm I'm studying INS stuff and you mm-hmm. know like what a convicted felon yeah. can be in this country, what it takes and and whatnot. And while I'm doing that, I go to the the sentencing guideline book, mm-hmm. and in the sentencing guideline book, it starts to talk about uh, the three strike laws. Right. You know what it takes to get a three strike. Right. And I had never investigated that before. You know, I just kind of like, you know, oh, you convicted felon, you, you got two strikes already. You already know those are two solid strikes. You yeah. know, you 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 gonna that's what you're up against. Yeah. Well, when I was doing that, then it started to explain what a strike was, and it talked about if the crime was ran concurrent, mine was ran concurrent. It talked about the intervening arrest, which was the most important part, was had you been arrested more than one time. Mine, I'd only been arrested one time. I never got out of prison. You know, I just had different cases in different states. Oh, so you weren't arrested for the Texas strike? No, I was arrested for Cincinnati, and then they sent me to Texas from Cincinnati. Right. So what they did is when they arrested me, they just took me to all the places that was investigating me. Gotcha. Okay. But I never got out of handcuffs. Right. I was literally in handcuffs the whole time. So that's how I beat the, the And that was enough. That's it. That's all it took. That loophole is enough. The fact that Not a loophole, it's a law. The law, right. But that that the, seems the way, like such way, a technicality. The way I told my lawyer to argue it is say for instance, it's like we had spots. Remember I told you I had spots where guys could go out one day and make ten thousand dollars in, in 30, 40 minutes. Right. He probably sold a hundred different people. Right. To do that. To make that 10,000, you probably sold it, you know, 20, 30, 40. I yeah. don't know how many people, but a lot of people. Right. Each one of those would be different cases. Correct. So if you was a novice, had never sold drugs before, and one day, from what they were saying, you be, you could become a career criminal in one day. Right. In 30 minutes. Yeah. Not possible. Right. Our, our forefathers who invented the law, they understood that, and that's not what they wanted. They wanted... You to be chastised, to be told about your crime, explain what your crime was, and then given a second chance. Right. And then if you do it a second time, you had to go through the same process. Well, you know, this is your second time. Uh, you, you did five years your first time. We're going to give you 10 years right. this time. If you do it again, we will give you a life sentence. And that's the way they wanted it done. And it wasn't done like that. Right. It wasn't. It was completely stacked on. You were being, you arrested, tried, processed in Cincinnati. And it was like the federal government had this thing in Texas that they just wanted to pile on you really quick without going through due process. Correct. Wow. And that seems like such an obvious, easy mistake for them to make. And that's what won you your freedom. But you're saying you discovered that uh, loophole, that mistake they made before you even got sentenced to life? Yeah. Yeah. I argued it to the judge before I got sentenced. Wow. So then why did you have, how long did it take you after getting the life sentence to get that appeal before the judge? About two years. Okay. So that's not very much time. Well, if you're doing time, it seems like a long time. Sure. Sure. Every day, right. When you're facing life. But obviously you go into that sentence like- with we call it in prison action like this got action yeah yeah so you yeah. went in I there figured, with action i figured i had action so you had action uh after two years you go well, back. you read that you read the jesse katz article yeah daily magazine yeah and you saw how i was talking to him yes of course because i knew that i should have won my case i, I right. knew that they would literally almost and and then what gary had did for me gary weber yeah by breaking Webb, that sorry, story gary Webb. is that he gave me the spotlight Right. So I knew that my case would probably make the books. Right. And they didn't want to read like rat they lost. Right. So I felt that I was going to get a good shot. Right. So Gary Webb, just for people who don't know, Gary Webb in 1996, the year that Rick gets his life sentence, that's when the story about the collusion with the CIA and the Nicaraguan drug traffickers from the 80s, that's when it all breaks. Correct. So now Rick Ross is as a household name. Uh, so you've also, I think the government too is looking at this embarrassed, like, geez, like this is shameful. And I think that also maybe helped in your resentencing. Don't you feel like that a little bit? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, she probably started to, to, to be in a little bit cause she, she took off an extra four years that she didn't have to. Right. Cause they could have given you 30 years when no, they she resentenced. She could have given me 20. 
Okay, so what was the final resentencing when you went back there? Well, she gave me 20 the first time. Right. And then uh, Booger and Fam Fam came out, and I got another, another. I won another appeal with Booger and Fam Fam. What the hell is Booger and Fam Fam? <laughs> A post-conviction rehabilitation. Okay. It means that, like, if you go to prison and then you rehabilitate yourself, mm -hmm. then you shouldn't be in, in prison. Right. Like, why are we keeping people in prison that don't need to be there? Right. And so I showed the signs that, that I had improved myself. So you had an exemplary prison record. Yes. And, and therefore, that was a time cut. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think even, do you think, you know, and it's possible, look, we know guys that got sentenced to life, had them on here before uh, for crack, you know, black guys, kingpins from the 80s who got out on compassionate releases right? When, when Trump passed that law in 2018. So, you know, I think you would have had a good shot in getting out, even if you hadn't got that. Well, uh, I was going, cut. I was going for it to be, to be so smart that they couldn't keep me in prison. Right. That's why I read so much. That's why I read yeah. 300 books. You know, right. I read the newspaper every day. Uh, I, I felt that the people of America wouldn't want anybody in prison that shouldn't be there. Right. Yeah. And, and I was going to, I was going to play on that. You're right. So 1998 is when you go back to the original judge and that's when she gave you, and that's when they tossed Let's, the life sentence. And gave me 20. Gave you 20. Ended up doing about 14. You got yeah. out in 2009. Well, I got another, remember I won another appeal, so. Right. So you got out uh, two, 2009. Yeah. Wow. Did what? you have people approach you in these 15 years you've been out? Have you had people approach you trying to get you back into the game? A couple people, you know, they play with it. They not, yeah. I don't think nobody really serious. Right. But I had people play, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Do you get angry? No. Nah. You don't get angry? You just say, I'm good? Yeah. I mean, I don't get really get angry about anything. You know, I'm, I'm having a great life right now uh, to come from where I come from and, yeah. and to be sitting where I'm at right now. Uh, I feel really blessed. Yeah. Yeah. We're blessed to have you here, my man. Thank you. So, you know, you've written... Uh, the bestseller. Tell us about, because we want to plug the dispensary, but tell us about the books too. Well, we're well, going to plug this up top as well, but I mean it. My fans, I, I, you better when go I, buy these books. When I was in prison, a lot of the young guys used to come up to me and ask me about game. Yeah. You know, and they was like, man, I sold drugs and I couldn't make, a, I couldn't make $10,000. And, um, you know, I would talk to them about, about business and how I thought about business and why I was able to teach guys how to become millionaires. And it came to me that, yeah, you know, you may never get to see a lot of these kids on the street. Why don't you put in a book for them? And that's when I wrote the book. Which is called? Freeway Ricky Ross, Untold Autobiography. And you can get it at my website. Don't go to Amazon, please. Yeah. Buy, you got to buy it off his com. website. Yes. Because all Ricky the money goes to com. him. And I'm going to autograph it for you. Oh, wow. Look at the key. You send it to everybody who buys it, right? Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. So you give business advice in there. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, I, I basically, what I wanted to do is run down to them what it would be like if they got into the drug business. Yeah. And uh, what would be the outcome? Yeah. Uh, uh, I just felt that what, what would have been like if I would have had a book that could have told me, right. you know, how to go about selling drugs. Or how to avoid selling drugs. Right. What do you think it's better now? <clears throat> do you think it's better now for young guys, young black guys from the hood? Do you think there's more opportunity now than when you were a youngster? I don't know. It's kind of bad right now. You think it's bad right now? Yeah, it's bad right now. In terms of what? Well, you know, there's a lot of stereo uh, stigmatism, you know, with the way that that black guys are looked at right now, you know. Uh, this image that 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 has been portrayed on TV, you know, the drug dealer, the gangster, the murderer. But that's uh, been going on forever, though. That's been going on since the 80s. You don't think it's gotten, you don't think situations have improved? No, for, it's worse right now. It's it's bad for, for, it's bad to be a young black male in America right now. Because back in your day, at least there was the crack game. Crack money was so abundant. You know, you made a lot of millionaires. Do you ever consider how many people you made rich? Yeah, probably about 25. Yeah. Did any of the, your your best workers, did any of them, are any of them alive today? Are any oh, of yeah. them free? A lot of them. Wow. I, had about, I had about six friends that had life sentences. They out right now. They, they got out. They how follow did, me. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> How did they get out on appeals or? They, they stayed in that library, man. Appeals, wow. you know, finding loopholes. Wow. Because you know we, we look at these prosecutors as being really smart, but they're not as smart as they're not as we give them credit for. Uh, and sometimes we give ourselves less credit than what what we deserve. Yeah. So do you give that advice in the book too? I, I I try to run down my whole life to them. Yeah. You know uh, how they should think, what they should be thinking about, uh, how to save your money, how valuable it is right. to save your money, you and know, invest your money, and invest it. Yeah. And what, your, what are some of your biggest regrets from that era? I don't really have regrets. You know, um, just lessons. You know, uh, everything for me was a lesson. I learned from it, and I'm using all of those lessons right now. Uh, with what I'm doing, I, my, my, I, my, 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 I guess if there's a regret, the regret would be that I ever got involved with cocaine. Hmm. Because I understood if if I wouldn't have got involved with cocaine, I was gonna figure something else out. Something else was gonna pop up that I would have gravitated to. Yeah, you you could have done anything. Now it would have taken you a lot longer, right? Just like hmm. kind of how you, when you got out of prison this last time, there's been a bunch of business ventures. Right. There's been movie scripts. There's been, you know, clothing lines. A lot of them haven't worked. Well, I don't know. But you've your mind. You I don't had know this if they haven't worked. I mean, okay. the, the clothes, the clothes. Yeah. The T-shirts got me out of homelessness. You were homeless. Yeah, I was homeless since I've been wow. home from prison. Wow. For about a year, year and a half. And I so was... it went from T-shirts. But my, my point is, like, T-shirts might not necessarily make Rick Ross rich. But the, the ideas, your optimism, everything is driving the next thing. Exactly. Everything is moving you exactly. forward. Exactly. You know what I mean? So I am rich. I'm rich, but people don't see it yet. Okay. I see my I see the riches already. Like it's it's like to me, it's like when when Mike gave me that first twenty dollars of cocaine and he gave me the story, I saw it. If what he was telling me was true, and I thought it was, I thought it could be, that I knew I was going to be rich. Now, when I went home and I told my brothers and all, all of the homies that I hung out with, they didn't believe it. They couldn't see it. Like right now, nobody can really see what I see right now, you know, with, with the cannabis industry, yeah. with the music business, um, with the movie, with the books. They don't really see that, but for me, it's like, you can't see us right there. <laughs> <laughs> and it is right there. It and they is. and those, all the homies laughed at you, and look what happened. There's, you're a, a street legend. You're an American. You have a place in American history because South Central and crack cocaine, for better or worse, are a part of modern American history. You, five foot six, Rick Ross, the grandson of a sharecropper from Texas, went and made good because you see it. Oh, absolutely. I can see it. And I now, can see. And I now, can see. now you see what's coming next now. Oh, I can see it so clearly. Like, y'all can't see this? It's right there. <laughs> it's right in front of us. Yeah. And um, it all comes from your mind. Everything that we become. I mean, that's biblical, right? What man, what is it? What man thinketh he become? If, you, if your mind can conceive it, your body can achieve it. Yeah, that's quantum physics. It's manifesting. <laughs> it's what white girls talk about on Instagram, but they're kind of right, you know? Well, you know, I look at my life, I manifested myself going to prison and then yeah. I manifested myself out. Yeah. You know, I knew I was going to prison before I'd ever been in a police car. How? Well, I just felt what I was doing was wrong and then yeah. I should go to prison for it. Wow. And then after I was in prison, I felt, oh, now you should go home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Done my time. <laughs> Did people in prison laugh at you or say, oh man, he thinks they he's going home? They used to tease me when I used to walk around with all the books and stuff. Yeah. Like, man, you reading all them help, self-help books and stuff. That stuff ain't going to help. Right. Haters. Mm -hmm. Did you not, have anybody? Not necessarily non-believers. Non-believers. It's okay. Same it's, thing. it's you know, they know not what they do. Exactly. So where is your dispensary? I'm really excited. So so you have to go to Ricky's Rick's, excuse me, Rick's website and buy his books. I know I certainly am gonna buy both of them. You have 
a new one, a relatively new one that came out. Um, but tell us about, because we have a lot of fans in Los Angeles and that come from all over the world that come to LA. Tell us about your new dispensary, where it is. Uh, my, new, my new dispensary is in Sun Valley. It's a uh, 9074 D, D E D Germo. Yep. D E. We're going to put the link in the description, by the way, so they'll be able to find it. Yeah, D Germo. Um, and it's in Sun Valley, Ten, which is 10 minutes from the Burbank airport. So you fly into Burbank. It's right there. Right there. Very convenient. Um, best uh, prices in town, best service. Look at that. Look at that. We're going we gonna to take care of you. Uh, our, our, our goal, you know, me and D, is that we, we want to have the best dispensary in the game. You know, we, we want to give people an experience that they can only get from us. You heard it. And what, what is your best prices, best quality, best customer service? Is that the key? That's to the making key. a dispensary I, win in I mean, a market anything, like LA? If you get best service, best quality, and, and you stay sharp, you know, you, you got to win in whatever it is. What is your goal from this? Do you want to have a bunch of them? Like, what is your five-year plan from now? Uh, maybe have 20, 30 dispensaries. Uh-huh. All in LA, or do you want to move to different franchise to different areas? Well, we want to start with LA first. You know, LA is the cream of the crop. This is the biggest market in in yeah. in, in in the world. Yeah. So we want to capitalize here. Uh, we want to also, you know, help some of the social equity applicants. You know, mm -hmm. there was a lot of predators going on when they started the social equity thing. I won my license under social equity, by the way. Okay. Um, right. And what we want to do is we want to reach out to people who who don't have the money to get started in social equity and help them get started. Yeah, that's great. Do you feel like you could make more money, more legal money than you ever did on the street? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, this time, I, I, I know that I'll be a multi-billionaire this time. And then when is the movie coming? <laughs> that's what we all want to know. Uh, we've, been in, we've been in production now, about uh, pre-production about a year. You know, we hired Mike Ho as a director, which you know, took a while to get a director. Who is he? Uh, Mike is a new guy. He's one of the top uh, video directors in, 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 in the game. Um, we, we were hoping that uh, Reginald Hutland would have did it, but Reggie had took on some other projects. Okay. And uh, he, he, he picked uh, Michael, uh, Mike Ho himself personally. Great. Great. Because so, so, I know that movie script has been in the works for a decade now. Yeah, we done did like three or four different movie scripts. Oh, my God. We had like eight writers, eight different writers. Wow. We had Nick Cassavetti for a while. Right, who wrote Blow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, no, no. I, I remember I like always, I'm like, when is this thing going to, when is it finally, and you know how Hollywood is. It takes forever. Well, they, I don't think that Hollywood really likes my type of story, you know, because my story is not the typical story that, um, you know, they want us to be on their violent drug dealer brave and you know breathing fire and and, yeah. and that's not the case i think my story is more going to be kind of like a love story you know where it was a group of guys who were were like brothers and and we stuck together and we did everything together and and we made it work by the way where is ollie what happened to ollie ollie is he got a little shop not far from here yeah right on western yeah he's right around the corner from here so he's doing good nah, he's doing all right well did he ever did he get locked up like what happened yeah ollie went to jail in indiana Okay, how long did he do? I think he did about seven, eight years. He okay. had 35 years, but he wound up doing about seven to eight. Okay. All right. Well, hey, look, compared to a life sentence, it's, uh, it's not too bad. No, you know? it's not bad at all. You know, do you feel blessed to be free? Yeah, I am blessed. You certainly are. Fortunate. Yeah. So billionaire, dispensaries, movies, music. Yeah, music, uh, clothes. Yeah, Sports, you know, I do boxing too. Yeah, I, have, I read I that. Man, I manage a couple boxers. Yeah, uh, I think boxing is easy. How do you how do you feel about like Hollywood and like shows like Snowfall and you know crack is really like big now in Hollywood. You know Hollywood gets attached to I like didn't a like theme. Snowfall. I, I didn't like it. I think it's stereotyping. Yeah, uh, it's nothing like what drug dealers really do. Yeah, um, and they fell right into the same stuff that the government. Uh, promote it to, to lock everybody up. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's weird because, yeah, uh, Hollywood latches onto a theme and one thing works and then, you know, they run with it for 10 once, years. Once people see my movie, they're going to wonder why did they why was they locking up and giving drug dealers so much time. Yeah. Yeah, that's what's the craziest bullshit is. And, and that's why I asked you at the beginning about the differences between crack and cocaine. And what we're finally seeing now is there's really... You know, the guy, the lawyer, the corporate lawyer sniffing a line of blow and, you know, 
the guy down on uh, Crenshaw smoking crack. There's no difference. Right. But they, that was the final, in my opinion, really racist, like institutionally racist uh, thing in America was the difference between powder, the sentencing between powder and, and rock cocaine. I hope the I hope the war on drugs ends soon. Don't you think? It ain't gonna do no good. Why not? Because they can't keep drugs out of their maximum security penitentiaries. Yeah. So they sure can't keep it out of this country. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Education. You got your own education, man. So it's possible. You show people, if nothing else, that it's possible. So I really uh, am thankful you came on here today. Uh, I will be. Uh, checking out your dispensary. Uh, do we can we get D on the on yeah, the pod cool. really quick? I just yeah, come on. just to plug that I know it, she's over there getting ready to fall asleep. This has been such a long she's podcast. Right. Uh, you are the co-owner of uh, I'm a or, partner. A partner, not the co-owner. Right. Right. Okay. Um, but yeah, just just plug the dispensary. Tell us just a little more about what we were talking about earlier um, about you know the the dispensary model in L.A. like. Um, what has been the big, the hardest thing about opening up a legal dispensary in a place like Los Angeles? Compliance. Why? Sure, what does that mean? Making sure that you are compliant with the city um, regulations. Yeah. With the Bureau of Cannabis Control for the state. Yeah. Um, that's probably the hardest part. It's because you have so much regulation. Yeah. You have so many people that are, you know, because it's California. Obviously, we know how hard it is just to start a regular business, right. much less, you know, a dispensary. But if you have the right people working there, yeah. Um, once you get started and get everything in order, yeah. Yeah, it's easy. But there seems to be a lot of money in it still. It is. I mean, I, 10 years it's ago, ridiculous. 10 years ago, I was like, ah, there's too many dispensaries. You can't make any money. The competition's too stiff, but there's no. like, it seems like endless money in it. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think your idea to put, you know, the location mm -hmm. is really good for where you guys are. What's the name of the, of this, of the dispensary? Freeway Ricks. Freeway Ricks. Yeah. I love it. Um, how long did it take you to find the location? I think that they had the location um, targeted for about a year or so. Okay. Yeah. But the good thing is that they didn't do it where you, they didn't search for it where you had to have your um, location first and then they would give you the license. Right. They had the license first right. and then they found the location. That's good. So then it gives yeah. you the freedom to like really take your time. Correct. Because location is everything. Yes. You know, and then branding, of course. Um, are you allowed to do deliveries or? We are starting our delivery service. Okay. Hopefully we will be meeting with someone this week. Wow. Yeah. Tomorrow. So <laughs> today or tomorrow. So that's like curb serving. Yeah. You know, it's what Rick used to do. Yeah. So we'll have, we'll have curb service. Yeah. We'll yeah. have curb service so, and delivery. Wow. So is that, is that something like where do you have to get a special permit to be able to deliver? Or well, it's a is that something that everybody that owns a dispensary can with do? With a micro business, you can do it. Uh huh. Yeah, with a micro business license. Yeah. Okay. That's what we have. Interesting. Um, what is that? Okay. Wow. Wow. That's a that's a fascinating. It's fascinating how far we've come. Yes. You know, in many ways. I mean, I know Rick talks about how bad things are, but you know, in many ways, we've since the 1980s, you know, we've advanced in this country. I think. I think so. I think that in, in cannabis, though, um, and I know that Rick mentioned that he has a social equity license. There are a lot of people out there that are social equity predators. So they'll see um, a person of color struggling with their social equity and they'll come in and either buy the license from them or take the majority of the equity mm -hmm. and make them the majority owner of the business. What is a social equity license? A social equity license is a license that is supposed to be for people who have been directly impacted by the war on drugs, mm. um, have had a, a drug um, 
crime, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and that's who those social equity licenses are supposed to be for. Right. People like Rick or people that grew up in an area where, you know, crack cocaine yeah. was a big issue. Yeah. But right. I find that a lot of the social equity applicants have not been uh, right, right. <laughs> that. <laughs> interesting. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I have felonies for marijuana trafficking. Yeah. Yeah. Would that make me? Could I? Yeah. Legitimately, I have three yeah. of them. I did time in prison. Yeah. Would I be a candidate? Yes. Well, you know, we might have we might have found our <laughs> spinoff business to this this <laughs> podcast here. Um, wow, that's that's fascinating. Well, I I cannot wait to check out Freeway Ricks. Maybe we'll do a, a promo video there and put it on our channel. Oh, you, you should know? come. We're I would love a, to. We're having a New Year's thing. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. I will definitely, I don't know if I'll be able to stop by for New Year's, but I will definitely come, you know, this week and check. I just think, I mean, that's so cool. Yeah. It's so cool. And I know Rick, you know, a lot of people because of his name try to take advantage of him and, you know, just reading about all of these shady business people that he was you know, getting involved with when he first got out of prison. I mean, way shadier than the people even in the street that he used to deal with. So I'm very happy that he's finally found something that's really working, you know, and that's why, you know, you're a blessing. And yeah. so I appreciate you. Thank you so much. You're I appreciate you. Thank I appreciate you for him. having him. Yes, of course. Yeah. No, it was our pleasure. And uh, yeah, you, you guys, thank you for listening. Go check out Freeway Ricks when you're in L.A., Go buy the books, check his website out. Thank you very much. We're out of here.